starter now. Hello. Uh, I hope you can hear me out out there and in here. Uh, I'll see if I, just for fun, let me see if this does anything. There we go. Um, this is a new talk, uh, and I am James Condard. I'm going to be sharing with you what I know about uh, Amazon Most and effects it has on the iPhone from an optometrist point of view. I'll tell you a little about myself and uh, how I got into this kind of thing and what I do at my job at the university where I do see patients uh, and I train the eye doctors of tomorrow, so hopefully we can have them uh, be informed about this. This is, uh, like all the pictures in the uh, presentation, uh, they are pictures for privacy reasons that aren't a patients of mine, uh, with one exception where it was privacy was released and I've hidden the name. Uh, and this is uh, an example, though, of uh, Ehlers Donald's patient. I'll let you know when it's not an Ehlers Donald's patient, uh, with some uh, conjunctival kind of heaping going on there, uh, where there's some extra tissue that can be pulled away gently. Uh, but that's, uh, I think, an example of how the eye is full of connective tissue, just like the rest of the body. Question? Yeah, is it, is it? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought it was, I thought it was a little clip, but that's the, uh, for the shirt. Okay, maybe you can hear me better now. Um, I don't, I will be showing some commercial products, mostly generic commercial products, but I, I only get paid by the university. I associate professor's salary. I have no financial interest directly or indirectly in any of these products. So, but I, I like to show them because, you know, the, that's the way sometimes healthcare works is you need to get something like eye drops or something. I'm told always to put learning objectives. You guys have the beauty of not having to take one of my tests, which I'm told are killer. Uh, so, so, and I will try very hard. I've, I've made this especially for folks that aren't eye doctors. So do let me know if I start to fall into eye doctor talk more deeply than, uh, than, than I need to. Uh, and uh, I, I'm going to try to go over different things from things like eyeglasses and contact lenses that can help people with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome to uh, binocular vision disorders that create diplopia or motion sickness if you have this condition, or if you, uh, the diseases of the eye, both progressive and non, that may come with it. And I know everyone in this room, by nature of being a zebra, is perhaps more of an expert on this than little old me. I have seen patients with this. I have a good friend in, in this group or two who, uh, who, uh, who have taught me some things, and I learn a lot from my patients. But, you know, like a lot of doctors, I, I wasn't planning to go to optometry school just to study Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. I don't think I knew what it was when I was in school. So I'll try to share with you what I know. So just to prove that I really do work at the university, that's me. Can you kind of see hearing him on <laughs> my white coat? Uh, that's one of my students there, not a, not a real patient. Uh, Pacific University has the only college of optometry in the northwest of the U.S. In fact, we're the only school west of Chicago and north of uh, the Bay Area in California for optometry. There are only uh, uh, fewer than two dozen of these schools across the country. And um, I'm originally from the East Coast, from Pennsylvania, but I, I uh, teach the last 10 years or so at Pacific. I will say that we are not surgeons. Those are the ophthalmologists. So we, we do some minor surgical-like procedures. We can even do some minor injections in and around, uh, not in the eye, but around the eye, on the surface of the eye. And we can snip things off if they don't require stitches. But we don't take cataracts out. We don't do laser surgery except in Oklahoma and Kentucky. And uh, we, we, uh, we do prescribe, however, medicines, including treating glaucoma, and we co-manage surgical conditions. I happen to be a pediatric optometrist, which is actually how I found out about this is because that's, you know, when we want to identify EDS is when people are, are young. And so, and I've had some patients with it in that age range. What I teach is, is how the eyes move. And so that's pretty pertinent, I think, to this, this syndrome. Uh, and also I, I teach about nutrition and diseases of the eye in children. So come on in. <laughs> Come one, come all. We also, I, I'm happy to say, have a, a clinic near here in, in, uh, in off the Beaverton Central Max stop, at Be the Beaverton Round, near um, right off the of Hall Boulevard and, and Cedar Hills, that handles 3D vision problems, that is double vision and problems with depth perception that often come with uh, acquired conditions or bumps to the head or various things, including EDS. So I'm, I'm happy to say I, I know a thing or two about that. And I've, I've, I have sort of permission to use this. <laughs> Some of you, m many of you maybe don't know Nicole Hess, who's my, my good friend uh, and has been my friend since before she knew she was a zebra. And I remember one, one time uh, she came to visit, not as a patient, but as a friend. She came over to my house 
to talk about these symptoms she was having, and we were both racking our brains to try to figure out what it was. And later that year, I started teaching um, about Ehlers-Danlos among the connective tissue disorders in a pediatric ocular disease course, and I never put the two together. Because, you know, when you learn these things out of textbooks, especially when you're looking at eyeball pictures and retina pictures, I'll show you some today, you know, you don't see the whole person in your chair. And I think American doctors, I, I don't need to tell any of you, uh, we can be very bad at looking beyond our specialty. And so I, I like to think optometrists are fairly well poised being non-surgeons and having more time as a result because we are cheaper to train and, and make and spend time with as patients, that uh, we have more time to talk to the patient and actually look at them holistically. And so we have the opportunity, we don't always succeed, but we have the opportunity to try to, try to, to see the syndromes that the other medical professions, including our, our ophthalmologist specialists, um, sometimes miss. So... All right, I don't need to show you, uh, and this is my only cartoon having to do with it. It's not really funny when you're going through this, but, but I think it helps a lot. <laughs> I, I, I think a lot of, uh, I don't know, the, the, the less money you make as, an, as a doctor, and optometrists are kind of low on the totem pole there, the, I like to think the more humble you are. I don't know how it is for PT. You know, <laughs> when you're a physiatrist or when you're an ophthalmologist, sometimes, you know, you're untouchable. But, uh, you know, we're, I'm humbled every day at my job and by my students, the 90 students that I teach every day that are checking everything I say on the Internet as I go. You know, <laughs> so, I, have, I have to make sure I do a full, you know, Google and YouTube and, and everything, uh, Wikipedia sweep before I and, and often edit the Wikipedia to fix it. <laughs> You know, so, so, that, so I don't get challenged every slide. But, uh, uh, you know, I think when you have doctors who are, are, are good at what they do, but maybe not good at what you have, then, then you, when you learn to speak their language, if you can meet them a little bit halfway, and this is what I heard when I went to the, the meeting in Portland last year, th this is what works the best. You know, if you, if you come and tell me there's something wrong with my vision that I think I need a special contact lens to fit, now you're talking my language. And, you know, now we can say, okay, glasses aren't working, at least regular glasses aren't working. Do you need prism? Are you seeing double? Do you need that contact lens because you have a bulging cornea, this keratoconus thing? And then, then we can, you know, you don't need to become an expert in optometry. Uh, and I, but I will definitely try to meet you halfway, and I, I, hopefully I'll demonstrate today that I've, I've, I've done that. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's really the thing. The doctors want to show that they can shine with the skills they have, but it's hard to speak their language sometimes. So, so I think that's, that's a skill there. I only have a couple slides that are all text, and uh, I've made them up for them with many slides that have no text except the title. So <laughs> this, is, this is taboo now uh, for me and, and many. You know, I don't want you to have death by PowerPoint. Um, but when you go on a place like Hippocrates, uh, Hippocrates is a, a drug database that's online. It has a disease database, too, and they just started charging 150 a year for that. I'm working on our library to get us access. But uh, this is what you'll find on there when you look up Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. And this is how it presents to, like, a pediatric optometrist or someone who treats young adults like myself. Uh, this comes up in the history if I, I probe at it, you know, but how I'm, – I'm, I'm concentrating on getting them to see right. And, um, you know, th some of these questions I would have to ask. It's a big part of the patient's history, but they don't think it's pertinent to report to me all the time as the eye doctor. You know, they're looking to get new glasses or contact lenses, maybe not see double anymore. So, you know, th but, uh, you know, this is probably a lot of you in your 20s. I mean, I, I look around the room, and am I the only male here? Yeah. <laughs> That's the same way in my, in my classes these days. All the eye doctors are now women, uh, or at least two-thirds or more are now women. So uh, if you want a female eye doctor, just find a young one. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, same kind of story a lot of you gone through. There were two cases that were pretty good. These are on, I think, Hippocrates, so the doctors realize, oh, you know, this is how it presents in young adulthood and teenage years and childhood. You know, the kid who's complaining about they, they can't walk through the mall and they want a stroller when they're eight years old, that's, that, that's potentially what you all have. So, it's, so uh, you know, this is, this is what I now look for when I have some of the things like that heaping up or the conjunctiva will go over, things like that. <laughs> you know, I, I try to connect the dots, and every once in a while you get it. You know, patients look at you funny when you ask them if they're bendy. But uh, every once in a while, they yeah, how did you know? I think I actually have a third-year student who's male who might have this condition. Uh, he's, he's got red hair, too. Is there a correlation? I've seen in one place in the literature, yeah, yeah. He, I, don't know, I don't know that he knows, but I, I, I've been polite so far, but I will tell him before graduation, you know, hey, by the way. Um, all right. I, the best pictures I found of Ehlers are really grainy, and I just in, as a – maybe there are better ones. Maybe you all have portraits up somewhere, you know, high school lockers and things. Yes, Edvard Ehlers. Yes, yes, I've just found grainy pictures of him. Um, and even when they're thumbnail, they're pretty grainy. I couldn't find any of Donlos. I don't know. Maybe he was camera shy. 
but it was a long time ago. I, I was taught, I think, by my friend Nicole, uh, that the classifications that were in my 2006 textbooks were already out of date. And, um, and, and in fact, these classifications, I, well, I think the descriptive ones, are they more current? Yeah, that's... I, uh, and the, the numbers afterwards I gave to my students to, to classify with others. But, the, we, you know, I was originally, when I first learned about this, okay, type 6 is the kind I want to look for. And then I read um, Dr. Driscoll's book. She's the, what, the optometrist zebra. You can get her, I have at the end, but you can get her uh, her ebook for buck forty nine and goes towards ZDS research, uh, you know, if you have a Kindle or Kindle app. But, uh, yeah, she, she says that the number of type 6 around the world at the writing of that book were about 60 people. But the numbers with ice problems are are many orders of magnitude higher than that and so so yeah so i i've i've moved away from this at least for that reason because you know i i, I care about those 60 some people but i i care more about it, all the others who uh who have the symptoms and aren't going to be that severe you know the, the type six ones i think are the ones with the such a brittle white of the eye that uh, a blow to the head even in sports like a soccer ball or something can make their eye burst and that's you know as terrible as that is that's not most of you so it's so you know these things. Okay, now here are the things um, – I'll move into new territory. Here are the things that I know a lot about, and now we'll try to connect the dots between where you are and where I am and what we can do about these things. I mostly – although I do a lot of pediatric care, I do primary care uh, as well. So I'm not just doing – you know, I won't turn away the parents of the, of the kid. And kids get glaucoma, not just senior citizens. And so there, there, there's a lot of overlap here. Um, I try to be – primary care means you are something of a generalist, but I, I try my best. Uh, my colleagues told me I had to choose between, you know, the inch-wide, mile-deep, and mile-wide, inch-deep kind of specialization. <laughs> and I've tried to, to do mile-wide, mile-deep as best I can in optometry because I think, I think it's possible. So we're looking for things that affect the connected tissues of the eyes, or sometimes indirectly they affect connected tissues which downstream from them – cause problems with the eyes, and I'll try to give you the patient's point of view as well as the doctor's point of view and the symptoms and the signs. You have the symptoms. We see the signs, and that, that makes, makes us to treat you better. And here's a picture. You know this one, as is, is I mentioned already, is the keratoconus condition. That's the bulging of the cornea, and shown here in schematic. I'll show some real pictures. Um, this is one of the most common ones. It goes with ehlers Donald syndrome. Uh, the cornea loses its structural integrity, and while it's supposed to be a convex, you know, bulging kind of bowl-shaped surface, if it starts to bulge too much at the bottom because of gravity and thinness and, and, uh, and such, then, then you end up with really funny vision that glasses can't correct completely. And then we have to get into other treatments for that just so you can see well. So, but all these things are associated, and I, I've made sure I've, I'm up on my Dr. Driscoll book and other sources <laughs> for this. So I'll, I'll try to tell you what I know. And please, if you at the end, if you have things that you know that I don't or conditions that you have, I, I can't treat you as your doctor right here now, but I, I'm happy to tell you, uh, I connect the dots the best I can. All right, so, so when your eyelids are stretchy and maybe not fully closing well, the eyelids are supposed to work like a squeegee on the eye. They're supposed to clear out foreign bodies that are always drifting in the air. They're supposed to spread an oil slick over the tears so that they don't evaporate too quickly in the dry weather. Uh, and they're, they're, they, they serve the purpose of you know, sweeping the eye clean. And if they're not completely tight as they should be, this happens a lot in senior citizens and it happens in younger folks if they've got a connective tissue disorder, then you get dry eyes. And maybe at night they don't close all the way and they leave a gap. And you have drying out at night when you're not blinking anyway that, that creates dry eye. And so sometimes when there's a gap at night, we have a, this, this kind of thing. This is a person that we put the fluorescein dye in, that yellow stuff we like to put in eyes. The eye doctor sometimes it's on a paper strip, sometimes it's in numbing drops, but you put that on and you shine a blue light on the eye, and then anywhere where the surface of the eye is rough, it will glow fluorescent yellow. And, um, and you can see the, the fluorescein here sitting at the upper lid. <laughs> that's, that's just what it looks like. Ideally, you see that and you see um, a nice smooth surface all over the eye, but when it's roughed up, it's like if you're, I don't know if you've ever worked on woodworking or anything. I do a little of that. Uh, and if you don't sand something smoothly and you go to stain it, then it, it's all blotchy, and that's how it comes out here. So this, it's, it's fairly painless, non-invasive. It stings a little bit if you have a dry eye for the yellow dye, but it's really easy to tell if somebody has dryness, and if they have that kind of pattern, that's right where the lids are supposed to shut. That person might be coming in for a morning eye appointment, and their eyes dried out overnight because their lids aren't tightly shut, and that can happen in ehlers donlos and other conditions. And these folks um, will often have watery eyes during the day. And so you tell them they have dry eye, and they, you know, wait a minute, why am I tearing all the time? And, um, and you know, there, there, is a, there is something called a reflex tear, 
when you get something in your eye or you, you feel this kind of foreign body sensation, we call it, of this dryness here, the corneal nerves are exposed to air, and it, it feels like a mild toothache to some people. It's pretty bad. And if you have it going on for years, you'll lose sensation in your eye, and you won't know it's dry after a while. So, so um, or, or you'll take one of those artificial teardrops, and it'll work for 15 minutes, and it'll be back to where you were. But people will get this burning, kind of gritty, sandy sensation in the eyes when they have this, and that's, that's how we, we diagnose it. So there are many products available, of course, over the counter. The first line of defense is usually artificial tears. There are a lot of people in the room here using tears or lubricant in the eye. Yeah, okay, some are. Here's a homeopathic one that I, I, I'm, I'm fine with. It's you know $9 or so for some millicent eye drops. that are. I, I don't know if they're extra effective as a homeopathic. I, I'm told from the homeopaths that, that this isn't exactly the way they, they use homeopathy with you know, combining them, first of all, and then giving everybody the same treatment who has the same condition. But anyway, it's, it's, it's inexpensive enough. Um, just to show you what I was mentioning here, if you have the corneas down here in the corner, the tears aren't just salt water. They're made up, again, of a, uh, of a kind of an oil slick to keep them from evaporating and a slippery layer at the bottom uh, of mucus. And the, the mucus gets thicker when you get something like an eyelash in your eye to coat it and have it slip out. So that kind of sandwich model of the tears is some, if you lose any one of those layers, you're not comfortable. And you may not see just right either, so that's, that's a concern. There is one prescription uh, medication for dry eye specifically if you are well insured. Uh, it's 100 bucks a month if you're not, or you can stretch it, maybe do 50 a month. Uh, the, this is called Restasis. I don't know if anyone's tried it or uh, none of my business, I guess, if you have. But this was actually um, discovered in veterinary medicine. It's, uh, it's used on those cute little dogs like we have, like chihuahuas, that have the bulge eye. <laughs> and they get dry eyes just because their faces are kind of flat and their eyes are kind of proptotic, we would say. They bulge out. And, uh, and, you know, dogs don't lie about the way medications work. So you try something that helps dry eye on a dog, and they're happy, and their eyes aren't red, then, then you know it works. And so this was approved for use in people uh, 10, 15 years ago now. Uh, and it's going to come off patent soon if the company's appeal doesn't go through. But... Uh, Maybe it will. You know how things work. And so it comes in these little milky white single-use vials, and you're supposed to rip the top off, and it's a twice-a-day thing. You put it in the morning, and they want you to throw it away and then put another one in at night. Um, you, you shouldn't keep the open vial more than 24 hours. Some of my patients are keeping it in the fridge, though, once it's open, and they use this has four drops in it at least, and they use it during the day that amount of time. So. So in any case, it comes in these tubs. So Restace is something you have to get by prescription, but if you have insurance or you can afford the 50 to 100 a month it's, uh, or go to Canada, then it's uh, a good medication. Uh, if you can't and you want the $4 generic, uh, there are mild anti-inflammatory drops that work like Restace. Restace is cyclosporin. This, uh, this stuff is fluoromethylone. It's a, it's a mild steroid. I don't love throwing steroids at dry eyes if it's chronic, but uh, it's something you can do if you have an acute flare-up now and then. And for $4 for a 100 drop bottle, you know, that's, uh, that's reasonable, especially for folks that don't have good insurance. So there is an ointment form of this, too, that can be used at night. Uh, you should be careful. Again, these are prescription steroids, even mild ones, can increase eye pressure if they're used willy-nilly. And so you should use them as directed and uh, not borrow them from friends and things. And there is something called Lacrocert uh, that is a, like a dissolvable little kind of cylinder thing. <laughs> Can you see it here? They say this is actually, this is put in wrong. This is the lower eyelid. This is put in right, and then when, you, you, when you're holding the eyelid open, and then when you let go, it should disappear. And if it doesn't bother you because your lids aren't so tight as to make it feel like you have a rock in your eye, then this thing melts slowly during the day. It's methyl cellulose, and it creates like a slow-release tear. And it's, it's not a medication, but it's a, like a long-lasting tear. So if tears work for you, but you have to use them all the time, this, as long as you don't feel it, this might be a good option for you for the dry eye situation. And these are meant to be used day and night. You know, you can put one in in the morning and let it melt as the day goes on. And, of course, there's punctal plugs. Now, <laughs> have you heard of these before? Yeah, they, they have dissolvable ones, and they have non-dissolvable rubber ones, silicone ones. Um, it makes some of my patients nervous when they hear they're made of silicone rubber because, you know, putting silicone in the body, uh, I, I understand, has not always been an effective thing to do. But these are tiny. Um, you have two tear ducts in either eye towards your nose. There's one on the bottom and there's one on the top. And the idea behind this is if it's simply you're not making enough tear, and it isn't because your tear gland, which is up here in the corners, is inflamed, and you need an anti-inflammatory, then you can put a plug in the drain or in 
both drains if you need to, and keep the tiers that you have in there longer so that you know evaporation doesn't rule the day. And so these are, you can get a, a two-week dissolvable one that's uh, made of collagen, and then you'll know if they're working. And then when that dissolves, it'll, your symptoms will come back. And if you like that, you can get the, uh, the rubber one. The collagen ones are cheap. Uh, you just have to get someone to do it. And uh, optometrists do this as well as ophthalmologists. And if, uh, if the, the rubber ones are a little more expensive, and that's best done under your major medical plan, if you have things, you don't need to have a vision plan, but uh, this would be a medical diagnosis for this. But that, that can be done, and, and people keep these for years sometimes, and sometimes they get dislodged with a sneeze or something, but they can stay for a long time. There's a convenient little bend in the, in the drain of the eye and it, just a little ways in that will hold it in place. And uh, some of them go down where you can't see them, and others, there's just a little curved surface that's up there just in case you want to get them taken out. So otherwise they can be flushed out in most cases and blow them out your nose kind of thing. They're little tiny, itty bitty things. So it's amazingly expensive for how small they are. But they're <laughs> so, And we all, Thomas, just know how to do these. So, And if you don't want to mess with your eyes at all, you can take a pill for dry eyes. And usually this is in the vitamin aisle somewhere. Um, and most of them have uh, omega-3 fatty acid in it. You know, it's, uh, you, you know about flaxseed oil and fish oils and things. Uh, I guess now they're talking about hemp seed and chia seeds are the latest uh, that I've heard. I, I tried to grow the, some leftover chia seeds on my chia pet. I honestly did, and it did not work. So I don't know. I don't think they're cooked, but somehow they didn't sprout. And I, I guess the ones that are on the chia pet probably are not suitable for human consumption. So I, I know my... <laughs> My cats like to eat the, the chia grass things. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll drag the chia pet around the house if I let them. But uh, but in any case, chia is one of the things that has omega-3s. Uh, and, it, you know, don't smell like fish if you, you burp it up a little bit. So, But these are pills for dry eyes that have a mixture of the, 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 the Theratiers, a mixture of fish and flaxseed oil. Maxi Tears has a bunch of other stuff in it. But uh, these have also been – they've been experimenting with this for macular degeneration of the eye as well. Um, it hasn't been – quite as promising in the early studies as we thought it would be. But certainly for the front of the eye, we think that oil slick does well with these thinner oils and also not only keep the tears from evaporating, but it's an anti-inflammatory. And most dry eye is really an inflammatory condition that you have. So you can go the pharmaceutical route or you can go the nutraceutical route if you like and, uh, and treat it that way. Um, there is another oral prescription medication for those that have severe dry eye due to an autoimmune disease. The the one I, I've been looking at lately in a patient is called Sjogren's Syndrome. You might have heard of this, and I imagine it can coexist with Ehlers-Danlos. Uh, but, uh, but Sjogren's Syndrome creates dry mucous membranes throughout the body, the, the nose, the mouth, the eye, and elsewhere. And um, this is actually oral pilocarpine, which is a very well understood plant-based pharmaceutical from the plant um, that's uh, – popular name translates to slobber weed. <laughs> Honestly, I don't make this up. If you chew it, it'll make you drool. And uh, it, it's, uh, the doctors call it a parasympathomimetic. It's, you know, when you're resting, you produce saliva and tears and things. And, and uh, this, if you take this, it will actually, if you have severe dry eye, this can actually produce some nice effects on all the mucous membranes. Uh, and some people just take it during the dry months in Oregon. Uh, I will warn you, the pilocarpine, especially topical pilocarpine, does make the pupils smaller which makes it for, for a patient hard to see at night potentially, particularly if you're older and you have smaller pupils anyway. Uh, and uh, for a doctor, can if you've been taking this for years and years, uh, usually more with drops, but you don't want your pupils to get so small that they can't dilate your eye to see if you have a cataract or look at your retina. So you don't want fixed small pupils because like, like most things in the body, if you don't use it, you lose it. So it's uh, these, you want to watch for that if you're on Salogen. But it is a, it's been around a long time, and it's a fairly inexpensive oral medication, as I recall. All right, we're kind of moving from the front of the eye to the back of the eye, and I'll, I, I spent more time on dry eye because it's, you know, it's kind of easy to relate to the front of the eye stuff, and many of us have that. It's an extremely common condition. Keratoconus is a less common condition unless you have a connective tissue disorder. And I think uh, Dr. Driscoll says, and I might have it written down on the next slide, it, it's 40% it's of the Ehlers-Danlos population has a, some form, mild or otherwise, of keratoconus. And that's remarkable because, you know, in, a, in a, a university setting like I work in, we have a whole contact lens department and a resident. And those people do, like, keratoconus all day long. And so I get to see less of it than I did when I was in private practice. Um, but I, I'm in charge of, in primary care, finding it and sending it to them when I, when I see it, not letting it go for years and years. So, so um but this is, might be what it looks like. And I, this you know, obviously an eyeball here. You've got a little skin tag going on. 
down below the eye. But this uh, cornea should not be looking pointy from the side. It should be nice and rounded like a, a bowl or a saucer. And that pointy cornea, which you can see better from some angles than others, causes funny vision. And a funny vision that glasses alone can't fix. And at first, it, it's like, well, I, I can't quite see 2020. I'm 2025 or 2030 on the chart, you know, but I'm legal to drive. And I have a little bit ghosty double vision, and it's still there when I cover one eye or the other. You know, maybe it's worse in one eye than the other. But, you know, I, I wear my glasses and I get by. It's, it's bad in the rain at night. But this is, you know, over the years, this can progress. And it's, it's a, a thinning thing. One thing we've noticed is patients who have this tend to rub their eyes a lot, like not just allergies, but like year-round. And we're not sure if the rubbing is a symptom or a partial cause of the thinning. So we do encourage people not to do that. First thing we'll do is make sure they don't have allergies that are making them rub their eyes. But uh, just in case, it contributes. Um, and, and you should be aware that's a symptom if you're, if you're seeing funny and you're rubbing your eyes a lot. We look. This is called Munson's sign when we see it after the doctor who discovered it. Uh, when the patient with keratoconus has a moderate or bad case and they look down, it'll actually make their lower eyelid look like a V-shape. And it, normally, if you look at someone, who's, it's hard to look at yourself. You have to take a selfie, you know, or something. But, but, uh, but you look at someone who's doing this, and, and the, the eyelid, lower eyelid is just nice and curvy. It's not pointy. And, if it, you know, this one, if the patient looked left and right, the point would move with the point of the cornea, and the cornea shouldn't be pointy like a cone. It should be smooth and round. So that's a sign, if your vision's funny, too, that that's maybe what's going on. So this is something that happens, again, when a lot of Valer's Donaldson syndrome symptoms happen, like in teenage years, um, and generally moves along a pace. I've had at least one Olympic athlete with, with it that I know of. I wanted to mention while we're here, uh, sometimes you might have heard of the blue sclera effect. Uh, this is also the sclera and the cornea are actually, the white of the eye and the clear part of the eye are actually like the same tissue. It's just the, the, the molecules in the cornea are turned sideways to allow it to be clear. But it's, it's continuous with the white of the eye. And... Um, and it's, when the white of the eye is thin, um, like when the cornea is thin, you'll, you'll be able to see it if you look carefully. And one sign, it's, it's, this, is a, I, this picture is not pronounced, but that's why I like to use it. There's a kind of a slate gray appearance that you sometimes see in babies or the very elderly uh, over the white of the eye when they look left and right. And that means their sclera is a little bit thin. And you expect that on a newborn or in an elderly senior citizen. You don't expect that in a, a young or middle-aged or, you know, uh, even just retired person. So if you're starting to get thinness of the, uh, of the sclera enough that you can, it doesn't look white anymore, it looks darker, then that's a sign that there, there is maybe a connective tissue disorder. And this is sometimes how we diagnose it. You know, this is, I've been seeing eyeballs all day, and this one's blue. Why? You know, and that's, that gets doctors' attention. So it's a good thing for patients to know, too. You know, this uh, can be a sign that it's, it's leading to keratoconus and things. We can make nice color maps of the cornea these days. This is just coming out when I was a student in the late 90s. And now uh, corneal topography has become quite advanced. And uh, this one is, is a fancy digital one. But you often they'll have you look inside at a, a target that's like a bullseye. It's black and white rings. And there's no camera flash, but they'll, they'll take a picture under those conditions. And the, the computer will map how the rings look. And a little bit of distortions, it'll figure out what kind of power that, that is in the eye. And there's a scale along the side, hard to see here. But basically, uh, generally on these, red is, is the top of the mountain and blue is like an ocean, you know. And so you're looking at a, a, a pointier eye here. This is, this is an ehlers Donlos patient with a keratoconic condition. And you can tell by the color map, even if you've never seen one before, that, oh, this is looking rather steep. And, um, and you can monitor the condition over time. So this would be something you get to diagnose it and also to monitor if you have the condition maybe see if your treatment is working, because there, there may not be a, a cure for Aizamas, but there's a treatment for keratoconus. And here we go. So in the old days, what they do is they'd say, okay, we're going to keep you in glasses as long as we can. When you can't see out of glasses anymore, then we're going to put you in contact lenses. And when I was a student, it was rigid contact lenses, and they try to push the cone back to make it round again. And that seemed to make sense. And then we discovered, and I feel like this was like decades late, we discovered just maybe since I had a school, oh, if we push the cone back, it will scar. And if it scars, then you need a new cornea. And that's why they keep eye banks around. But nobody really wants a new cornea if you don't have to have one. Cornea transplant is a big deal. You know? So uh, people sometimes get more than one. It's like any organ transplant in a way. You have to be on anti-rejection drugs. And, and so you know, it's, it's not an ideal situation. So how can we prevent that from happening? Well, we can, we can watch it in glasses, and then we can do a contact lens that maybe vaults over top of this cone thing and doesn't ever touch it, and just let the tears fill in the gaps to make the, the eye smooth again. And that seems to work better 
for the medium term, and often insurance will cover for medically necessary contact lenses for patients that have keratoconus and similar conditions. And I mentioned some things here that doing the, the surgery, this is what I don't do this, the ophthalmologists do, but it's a tough thing because if you have a connective tissue disorder, it's hard enough to transplant a cornea. It's harder still if, if the, the sclera, the white of the eye, is, is not particularly strong. And so you have to do this thing and wait six months and, and then do another procedure. And yeah, so you want to avoid this if you can. So contact lenses are an option, and here they are. So the, uh, you know, these aren't the disposable lenses. They do make some soft ones that are for keratoconus. About 20% of our patients can wear those, at least for certain stages of their uh, disease. But we're doing now these, these giant scleral lenses again that are, that are instead of the little ones, I'm here to see a smile, instead of the little ones, they're, they're big. And they're great because, one, they cure dry eye, it seems like. They keep a nice water reservoir under them all the time. Uh, we have had folks that are after LASIK surgery have really dry eyes, and they have to wear the, these moisture goggles, and, and we put them in a scleral lens, and they're, they're cured, you know, <laughs> as long as they wear the lens. So the, uh, but you can do this also for keratoconus, and it really does create for a nice new kind of corneal surface that won't stop the condition from progressing, but will give you good vision, maybe better than 2020 while you're wearing it. So they're pricey, though. These are you know, hundreds, if not a couple thousand, for the lenses and the fitting to get originally fit with them. So it's, yeah, it, it's almost like getting LASIK. You, know? it's, you, have to, you have to have some money to do this. And, and unless you have real Cadillac insurance, you're probably paying out of pocket. But if that's the only way you're going to see, you know, that's, that's often a price people will pay. The new really exciting thing, and Dr. Driscoll, I was glad to see mention this too, is called corneal collagen cross-linking. This is a, um, a laser procedure, so it's done by ophthalmology, but it is as non-invasive as lasers get. They actually bathe the eye in riboflavin, which is that bright yellow vitamin B2, and they do that for about a half an hour. And then to strengthen the collagen in your cornea, they use a laser that is attracted to the riboflavin and doesn't go past the surface of the eye. And it strengthens the matrix of the cornea, and it seems not only to arrest keratoconus, but it may reverse it a bit. And so this is, if you, were, if you have a far gone case, if you've had this for, you know, 40 years, you're probably not a good candidate for this. But if you're a uh, young or maybe middle-aged person with a newly diagnosed keratoconus, this is a great procedure. Um, there, the FDA, unlike in Europe, in Europe it's been going on for, I think it was discovered in Germany in the late 90s, and they've been, it's been approved in Europe for over 10 years in a few countries, uh, maybe most countries in the Euro region. Uh, in the U.S., it's still going through FDA approval for like four years now, and I don't know, you know, sometimes it drives me crazy, <laughs> things like this. In fact, Europe is making fun of us now. They're, they're saying eye doctors in America are not practicing the standard of care for keratoconus because this is clearly orders of magnitude better than replacing the tissue that you have or waiting for it to get to that point. So we do have folks in the Portland area that are doing this. Uh, the problem is when it's not FDA approved, it's probably because the insurance companies don't want to fork over money for it, in my opinion. And so you, you may have to get this out-of-pocket or partially out-of-pocket kind of procedure. But, but this would be what I would send my own mother for, you know, if, if she needed it. So, so corneal collagen cross-linking, that's, what you, um, that's the standard of care for this. All right. For doctors that don't have a topographer or don't think to use a corneal topographer, and there are a lot of small eye doctor's offices that don't have it or don't use it, like a, an ophthalmologist that doesn't do cornea stuff, they might not have one. You know, a lot of optometrists, if they work at lens crafters things, they might not have a topographer. Um, so this is all they're seeing in the microscope, and you're telling them you're seeing funny. I look at this, and in retrospect, this is pretty obvious. It's a bulging keratoconic patient. This should all be smooth and smooth. And, but, you know, it's, it's subtle in a microscope even for the eye if you don't know what you're looking for. And it's definitely, um, you know, sometimes you need to go to a place that has the equipment. That isn't, isn't, um, it's not six-figure equipment to buy. It just takes up space and things. And most, most offices um, may not have it. So, so anyway, uh, that's what you need to know. That's probably the worst eye complication uh, that I, I can think of with Ehlers Donlos, except for the, some of the retina stuff that we'll get to as we go deeper in the eye. Am I doing okay on time? Was, I hope, hope it's of some interest to folks. Okay. All right. So I would be remiss if I didn't mention what optometrists do the most of, and that is treat nearsighted people. And I see several of us here, and there are probably others who are, are wearing contact lenses who I can't tell, you know, are nearsighted, except 
by your you know intelligent looking demeanor because you know nearsighted people it's not just a myth but you know we nearsighted people were smart right you know that's the you read all the time if they get nearsighted these days it's tablets and things you know that, that, that's the that's the the legend so <laughs> nearsightedness i mean we, we treat our train our first year students they have light focusing in the eye that is not all the way back on the retina these eyes actually for all the nearsighted people in the audience the your, your eye is now is actually too strong and not too weak and I, the only way you're going to believe me on this, because you have a restriction on your driver's license and everything, and you know you've you felt you have weak eyes all your life, is when you get to be in your 40s, like I am, that that suddenly your glasses start to get thinner, and you add a bifocal to a nearsighted lens, and it's less powerful, and you can take off your glasses in your 40s and see very close, very nice. Can't see any of you, but uh, so so it, it it pays back later when you're nearsighted. The problem with Amazonas is nearsightedness comes from the eye growing too long from front to back. And Danlos, it seems that the stretchy sclera allows that to happen way too much. And so some folks have, and maybe some here or some listening, have a lot of nearsightedness. You know, I, I've got three diopters. It's pretty good for reading. Uh, my wife has like six or seven diopters, not so good, you know, but, um, but they get to be more, as we'll see here. Uh, so the patients can see close, but this, this may not be close enough for some people with high nearsightedness. They, they may need to go up, you know, inches from their nose. We used to joke if they were reading a newspaper that they get newsprint on the nose. You know, that's that, that kind of nearsightedness. It's not particularly functional. I'll mention that there are some things that, that rarely can contribute to this besides the sclera being weak, and sometimes the lens falls down. This is an Ehlers Donless patient who has a subluxation of the crystalline lens in the eye. Uh, this one has actually become rather opaque, and so this patient is seeing light, but without a – it's almost like someone who's had a cataract removed without an implant lens – this patient will have a very high far-sighted prescription if they're looking around the edge of the lens. But the connective tissue holding the lens in place sometimes is also weak. This happens more often, I think, in Marfan than in Aosdalos, but I'm told there's some overlap. There's a Marfanoid type. Uh, yeah, so, um, so uh, and often, by the way, for what it's worth, the, the subluxated word, you can see, again, this kind of setting sun lens should be in the center, but often it's kind of hyperluxated. Um, for one reason or another, it goes against gravity and it floats up and towards the nose, and it's tethered by these things we call zonules, which are connective tissue, but they, it's almost like a, a helium balloon that floated away. You know? So a lot of patients, though, in their childhood, if they have a little bit of this going on, their lens are looking through the edge of their lens, and it'll drive the eye to become nearsighted because the optics aren't right. And the eye wants to grow when it can't quite see well because when we're born, almost all of us are farsighted with short eyes, and the eye grows until that becomes clear and then stops. So if there's nothing else goes wrong, but if your lens is off center or the connective tissue is weak, then it keeps growing past where it should. So just a little bit on that. Um, what we see as eye doctors is we see um, stretch marks in the eye, uh, right? It was done stretch marks. They're everywhere, you know. Uh, so I'm told. <laughs> so um, so you know, this is the same patient, right and left eye. I don't know if you've looked at a retina before. This patient, I can tell by looking, is a very light complected patient. I don't know if you know, but you know. It's not just your hairdresser who knows the, the color of your natural hair, but your eye doctor will know, too. This is a blonde person, <laughs> and so it's a very blonde retina. Um, and uh, we have, particularly around this left eye, we have a big, you see that white ring? That's sclera around the optic nerve, the thing that looks like a fried egg for everyone who can't see me pointing. I guess I can do this like I do in the classroom. Yeah, that white ring there on the left eye. Uh, and that's, uh, it's actually called a staphyloma. It sounds like some kind of terrible cancer, but really it's just a stretch mark of an eye that's grown too much too fast. And if I was just shown that picture by a student of mine, I would say, okay, they're double-digit nearsighted. They have four times my prescription. And sure enough, this person is a minus 14. I'm a minus 3. This person's minus 14 on this eye. The good eye is only a minus 8. And, um, and to give you an idea, at minus 8, you'd be focusing at about four or five inches from the nose. It would be the farthest you could see without your correction. And a minus 14, uh, that's, that's uh, even shorter. That's maybe two, three inches away from the eyeball is the furthest you can see. So nobody, rarely are you born with this. This just comes from growth and things, just way too much in this case. So you can get, that's very much like one of our chihuahuas. Uh, you can get nearsighted glasses, of course, and that's what people do. It, the, you know, the, the average nearsighted person gets them in third, fourth grade. The school nurse gives you a note, you couldn't see 20, 40. Uh, but uh, these folks, you know, you, unless the uh, Ehlers Donlos is striking late, it's uh, it may be happening sooner. Some of people hearing me now might have gotten glasses in first grade or sooner. And uh, you can tell often by the thickness of the prescription when someone started with the glasses, because you don't start late with this kind of prescription as a rule. So, and the glasses work, but they, you know, they do make things look really small 
when you have the lens an inch away from the eye and they make it hard probably to drive at night and things. So many of these patients will then, uh, with or without always honest, will offer contact lenses. I showed this. You all know what contact lenses look like. This one is reasonably big. Uh, having stretchy eyelids might be good for application and removal of contact lenses. So anyone who's thinking about this, for one reason or another, it's, it is easier to put contact lenses on the eye when your lids aren't super tight. You know, my, my Asian patients have a harder time with it. It's, it's no question. Um, it, it does require some coordination, um, and big fingers don't help. But, uh, you know, that may be why more women are good at this. And I also have a theory. I think, I think women are just better at messing with their eyes than guys are. <laughs> Whenever I have patients faint because I've touched their eye, which happens like every year, <laughs> not just me, my interns too, <laughs> it's always the big guy. You know, it's the big football player-sized guy who comes in. The bigger they are, the more likely they are to, to crash on you. <laughs> and so, yeah, so, um, uh, but this is, you know, this is how we look to apply the lens to your eye. There are definitely contact lenses if you've tried them years ago and maybe a rigid lens, They've come a long way with comfort. I think Dr. Driscoll talks about, I didn't include one today, but they have now also hybrid lenses that have a, the rigid center for the perfect optics and easy handling, and then they have a skirt of soft lens on the outside. They're, they're made of both, and you, you can, you know, so you have comfort plus perfect optics, and it's a wonderful combination for a lot of conditions. Um, those are called synergized lenses if you're interested, and again, I have no financial interest. Um, one thing that, that Dr. Driscoll mentioned that I almost forgot about because these are rarely done in, in um, my practice is the intact implantable contact lens, so to speak. It's more of a ring, really. You can see how tiny the thing is. Uh, and this actually can be put in, in the cornea and is removable, I'm told, although, you know, it's not like right on the surface or you can just peel it off, but it's uh, like a contact lens normally is. But this is, this is particularly for someone who has a, a weaker cornea, maybe some irregularity to the cornea, like with the keratoconus, and has a high prescription, maybe too high for the average contact lens. And this is a way to hold the structure of the cornea and to, to correct a larger prescription, while at the same time being not quite as uh, invasive as LASIK surgery or that kind of thing. So, so this is, is uh, there aren't too many surgeons that are doing this. It's not, you know, there are a lot doing LASIK and PRK and not so many doing intacts. And you definitely, if you wanted to go this route, you want to make sure you were a good candidate. But um, the zebra optometrist I've read, you know, and I'd like to meet someday, she says that this is a reasonable procedure for an EDS patient with the right surgeon, um, given it's rare. Now, I think what we all agree upon, though, is that refractive surgery is con contraindicated <laughs> if you have EDS. So this is LASIK where they have a flap, they make it either chemically or with a blade, and then they laser out some of the peak off of the eye, they reduce your nearsightedness, they put the flap back. Part of the reason it's not a great idea in, in Amos Donlos is it, the cornea isn't the problem, it's the stretching length of the eye. And there, there are other people that have that issue, but you can only flatten the cornea so much, even if it's a strong cornea. If it's a weak cornea, you really want to be careful because you don't want the cornea to become weaker by making it thinner which is what refractive surgery does. So um, for the same amount of money, you could have corneal collagen cross-linking done, uh, I think, and, uh, or a scleral lens made. So, so, yeah, definitely not a good idea. The problem is I think it happens sometimes before people know they have EDS. And, um, you know, because you can do this once you turn 18, your prescription has been stable for a year if you have the money. Sometimes people win a contest and they have a Groupon, you know. <laughs> really, I mean, it's, yeah, it's kind of scary. I, I, I don't entirely trust surgeons that use Groupons. <laughs> you know, it's your eyes, you know. <laughs> so it's a, but, you know, why aren't they busy, you know. <laughs> it's a, there's a reason for that. So, all right, or the price is too high or something. Okay. So um, going back deeper in the eye, uh, one of the things I specialize in, in fact, one of the things that I have, I, I, I guess when it comes to the, the eye care world, I, I, the, the closest I get to being a zebra is, while well, I have an extra bone in my feet. I have to wear, you know, Keen or Tiva sandals all the time, even in clinic, because uh, I get extensor tendonitis on top of the feet, and that probably is a small piece of what a lot of you folks go through all the time. But um, uh I also have strabismus, and so although I run our 3D vision clinic, I actually have no depth perception, no two-eyed depth perception. And when you grow up with that, it doesn't bother you as much as when you lose it as an adult. I'm, I'm in much better shape than many of my patients who have recently lost theirs. Um, but strabismus is when the eyes are not pointed at the same place. It can be, uh, if you'll forgive the parlance for someone who has the condition, that this one was labeled, I think, on the site I got it from as a wall-eyed thing, we would call it exotropia in, in, you know, or coding for it, uh, you know, their cross eyes are what I have, although it's too small for most to see it. 
Uh, but this is when the eye muscles and the, the cranial nerves that control them aren't working like they should. Some are, some are born with this or get it in infancy, but, but you can also get it through an indirect route from a connective tissue disorder, and I'll try to show you why. But just to, to get us all on the same page with types of strabismus, uh, there's, there's inward-turned um, strabismus. This is esotropia. This is what I have. Uh, also, all Siamese cats, like our cat Blue here, have the condition. It's hardwired from birth. And uh, they've learned to see singly with their eyes crossed, uh, Himalayans and Siamese. If anyone doesn't like cats, I apologize. But, you know, that one came with the wife. So, um, And, you know, I've got, I got to warn you that the pretty cats, um, they're princesses. And they, uh, they're nothing but trouble. And they know you'll forgive them because they're pretty. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know how she manages to, well, you know, she can make a magazine stick to the hardwood floor by, with a hairball. I don't know how she does it. So, uh, <laughs> Too much information. Uh, there, is, there is a single cranial nerve. You know, we have these 12 cranial nerves, and this is not a medical lesson for you, but, but you've had a, quite a, a schooling in medical things, I'm sure, with being zebras. But the, uh, but the, the, the sixth cranial nerve um, controls simply the moving the eye out straight. And when one of them is weak, either from birth, injury, or acquired, it lets the eye cross. And, and often you won't notice it looking at your cell phone and things, but when you look far enough away, and particularly if lighting isn't perfect, like driving at night, especially in the rain. You'll get double vision, side-by-side -side double vision. And if it, if it wasn't there before and it's there now, that's the kind of thing I see all the time. It's usually there's a sixth nerve has been palsied or partially paretic. Uh, Dr. Driscoll says this happens in the cavernous sinus, which is one of the big sinuses behind your nose where, where a lot of the cranial nerves go through. And if the blood vessels are a little weak, particularly I think the venous blood vessels, the veins, uh, then the leakages in there, a slow leak, can actually not be noticeable otherwise, but can damage one of these nerves, causing the eyes to cross. And I believe her theory because I've seen it happen for other reasons. So, um, so this can happen, and I, I show young people here like the ones I treat, but it, it certainly happens in adults all the time and in seniors as well. Outward turned eyes, that would be the, the, actually the third cranial nerve, the oculomotor nerve. It controls four of the eye muscles, but, um, but particularly the one that pulls the eye towards the nose. And when this happens, uh, the eye will wander out, and you'll get that that outward appearance, you'll see, again, double vision, often up close, worse than far away. Because when you're looking close, you really have to have your eyes turned towards each other. And if one's out, you'll really notice it. Is a question like lazy eye? Well, many of my patients will call this lazy eye because it's visible. But, uh, but we define amblyopia as not seeing well with glasses due to um, an interruption in development before age two. So, so the lazy eye we, we call is, is a little different. Often it goes with a turned eye, though. So there is overlap there. I had to include a few celebrities, and here's one of them. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a shame when we can't interview them because they're not with us anymore. But um, uh, eyes can also go up uh, relative to the other eye, and this is called a hypertropia. This one is often subtle. This patient has it. I think it's actually uh, – you can find it two ways. Sometimes they tilt their head away from the eye that's up. Other times you can see a little bit of white of the eye. As you can see, I'll point with my mouse for those not in the room – uh, a little bit of white of the eye under, I think this left one, can't quite see a head tilt here, but it's just a little higher than the other. Sometimes you can look at the light reflections on the cornea and see it. But what this patient will have, if they don't have double vision and up and down double vision, they'll get motion sickness. And uh, many of these patients have a real subtle one of these, maybe from birth, and they can't read on the MAX train or in the car. Um, sometimes they're not even comfortable driving. Uh, and so uh, they think Abe Lincoln had one of these. Often there's facial asymmetry if they had it from birth, and I think you can see his left eye also looking at us looks a little bit higher than his right in that famous picture. Well, it's, what's many famous Lincoln quotes, but what's one of them? If I was two-faced, why would I choose this one? Is one <laughs> thing that he said. Suspected that Marfan syndrome, right? We've all heard that. Yeah, yeah. And here is, it, for those that I, I tried very hard, I mean, if you were my students, I'd be throwing these at you left and right, and you'd have to memorize the cavernous sinus and everything that goes through it. And, uh, but, but I won't do that to you because you're not. <laughs> when they, when they, when you, sometimes when you have a leakage in that cavernous sinus, uh, the, there is a sign if there's a slow leak in the back. It's called a posterior carotid cavernous fistula. <laughs> but, uh, but that slow leak will sometimes make you have what looks like an eye infection. One of your eyes will become really bloodshot. And the thing is, you're going to be able to hear or feel your heartbeat in your eye because the, the leakage, every time your heart beats, is going to squirt out a little tiny bit of blood, and you're going to feel it. And if you tell the doctor that, they, a smart doctor is going to have you close your eye and put their stethoscope over your closed eye to listen for it. And you can actually hear it's called an orbital bruit. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, I, I don't know if I've heard people – I've heard more hiss and a whoosh, but, yeah, I mean, it's possible, you know, if you've, if you've heard something like that. I don't know what it sounds like from being in the patient's head, you know. On my stethoscope, it, does, it sounds more like a whooshing sound, but it's not quite the same as when your ear is right there, you know, so maybe. Um, anyway, if this happens, and particularly if you have a new onset double vision, often crossed eyes, this, that's a pathognomonic for the condition. And, and some of my, my textbooks say that, you know, if it's in the back – it can be, you know, not an emergency and you watch and wait. But I've had patients come in a year later who still have it. And, you know, first thing when they come in like this and it's only one eye looking really red, I, I think they have an eye infection, you know, and we give them some eye drops and it's still red, you know, and, and then, then you get to asking questions. So, so be aware of this as a possibility. And, again, Dr. Driscoll talks about this if you want to read more. Definitely seen it, often in young women. I wonder how many had EDS. You know, following one now. All right, so uh, we can treat uh, strabismus with PRISM. Uh, our, our former First Lady and Secretary of State, like her or not, she, uh, she had an uh, incident with this. I think this was her, her last time appearing as Secretary of State. It was noticed on the high-def TVs that she was wearing a press-on PRISM on her lens, and it, it, it's so high-def that I, it's hard to tell on the, uh, on the wrinkly screen, but I, I can actually tell that that's a base-out PRISM, so I know that her eyes crossed. <laughs> and she, uh, she therefore got an uh, abducens cranial nerve 6 palsy, and she had a blood clot and I think maybe a little concussion right before this happened. Now, she stopped wearing her glasses again. She's been heavily nearsighted for years and wears contact lenses. I don't know if she – first ladies can probably get whatever health care they want, you know, former first ladies. So I don't know if she had surgery or uh, got a special contact lens that included the prism or, or just recovered from the condition. But this, is, this would be the temporary kind of prism you could get if you got a sudden onset double vision and maybe you're waiting for it to heal that we could give you so you weren't having to wear an eye patch to see single or close an eye to drive and things. So, so I prescribe PRISM a lot. Not all eye doctors do, and almost no ophthalmologists do. The contact lenses and PRISM are uniformly hated by all eye surgeons. It's just not their thing. So um, just like I don't take cataracts out. What the ophthalmologist will do, if you have a long-standing large eye turn, and I'm sorry if this is too gory, <laughs> Just Wikipedia, but, you know, uh, they'll do eye muscle surgery. And this is, this is unlike cataract surgery where you're awake these days. Eye muscle surgery is done while you're knocked out. It's under an hour to do, and it is outpatient. You usually go home the same day. But you will be, you know, with an anesthesiologist. No, they don't need to open the eyeball, but they, they move the muscle around to make you see single again. And then any little bit left over we can take care of with glasses. So your glasses will get really thick if we had to take care of large eye turns with PRISM. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention what I do at least one day every week, which is vision therapy. That's my residency was in vision therapy and rehab. And uh, we do eye muscle exercises for some of these conditions. And for some folks, particularly folks under 40 who have a lot of focusing power left, unlike me, uh, this may be a, a, a good way to go. So I have I've, you know, at least one patient right now who's got a little bit of prism for the up and down double, and we're doing muscle exercises for the left and right double. And, you know, and that will keep her glasses a little thinner and maybe allow her to wear contact lenses. So, there, for folks that have uh, the pressure in the cavernous sinus and if it can't be repaired, if there's a leakage back there, you can take a diuretic. Uh, one of the ones that's gone generic is what's called Diamox, the brand name acetazolamide you may have heard of. Uh, this is great for any time you have in increased intracranial pressure, either due to cerebral spinal fluid pressure or, or a blood leakage that is otherwise being watched and managed. So th this can help, and it can help relieve double vision and jiggling eyes and all kinds of crazy things that happen when those nerves get under duress. So um, I understand it's also used by mountain climbers to help them with the oxygen at high altitude. All right, so uh, the final couple things I have are about retina, really. And um, uh, am I still okay to another 10 minutes or so and then questions? I, I hope I don't want to go too long. Um, so... Glaucoma is one of the things that's listed as an at-risk thing for Ehlers-Danlos. It's, um, I, again, if, as near as I can tell, it's not a direct cause. It's a, sort of an indirect cause like the eye turns. It has to do with blood flow and particularly with the aqueous fluid that comes out of the blood and, and is in the front of the eye that um, often the pressure gets real high. And that's how we notice it as doctors. But when your eye pressure is high, it's kind of like when your blood pressure is high. You don't always feel it, right? You know, some people won't notice when their blood pressure is extremely high, and I think they'd have a killer headache. But if it creeps up over the years, you, you readjust your homeostasis, you get used to it. Um, what you do notice, uh, indirectly notice, is that your side vision is eroding away. And patients actually don't see a blur. What they'll see is kind of like the back of their head. You know, you're, you don't think about it. You have no vision back here, but you don't see a black curtain all around the outside, right? It's just not there. And if that not there stuff starts to creep in, what you'll notice is you start running into things, hopefully not with your car. 
but maybe I refer to like the grocery store, you know, uh, blindsided by someone with a cart on the, on on a side you can't see, or, or missing stuff on the shelf. My grandma had glaucoma, and she uh, she went, went when we discovered it. She'd visiting my sister, and my sister also had a cat at the time, and the cat was on the coffee table in front of grandma, who was on the couch, and uh, she asked where the cat was. <laughs> And it was right there, you know, but it was in her blind spot that she had from glaucoma. We just didn't know it was glaucoma until a couple of incidents like this started to happen. So that's the kind of thing that occurs. And when Grandma moved her eyes, she then saw the cat. She could read. She could read the eye chart, 2020, you know, but uh, there was a missing spot there. So this is probably too technical for uh, non-eye doctors, but, uh, again, it's showing you kind of a tunnel vision effect. When you hear about Ehlers-Donlos people getting tunnel vision, it's from a glaucoma kind of thing. Uh, the optic nerve, what we see is, it's hard for me to tell where we are in the eye in the upper left here, but the optic nerve is becoming excavated. It's, I, I've heard some patients describing it as the, the hole in the donut's getting bigger. Um, and it's, if this is the front of the eye, it's, the, the fluid is building up there. Really what's happening, though, is we're losing blood flow to the optic nerve. And when you lose blood flow to the optic nerve, you lose oxygen. When you lose oxygen, the nerve starts to slowly die. And the nerve's made up of like 1.2 million neurons when you're born and you lose some due to age you know but but when you start to lose them fast then the the cup in the optic nerve becomes bigger and it may be because the pressure in the front of the eye uh not you know circulating well with the blood vessel issues leads to cutting off of blood pressure in the back of the eye it's kind of like when you rub your eye and everything goes gray or white you know if it's your eyes constantly pressing from front to back you'll lose blood flow so that's really what's happening there we, of course, check your eye pressure, and the, the way you want to do it with glaucoma people is not just with the ear puff, but with this, we numb your eye, and we use the little blue ring and gently touch the surface so you don't feel a thing, but it measures the pressure, and it's the only precise way to measure the pressure for glaucoma, with the exception of a few very expensive instruments that are kind of rare, so rare we don't even have them at the school. We will test things. I ha I, how many here have had a visual field test done, you know, where you, you sit in the bowl and you wear an eye patch, you press a button, right, you know, and they're seeing what your side vision is like. Look straight ahead, and when you see a flickering light off the side, press the button. Uh, and we, we really should add video game noises to that because it's, it's easy to fall asleep <laughs> doing that, even if you're otherwise had a good rest the night before. When we see this kind of pattern where this is what this is, is someone's vision up top is missing, you know, kind of the opposite of my grandma. It, come, it starts as an arc, and then it becomes a, a tunnel vision kind of effect where this pink area down in the lower left of the picture is, is missing. And when that starts to happen, that's, that's what you don't want. You don't care if you're pressuring your eyes high as long as you can't feel it, but you don't want to lose your side vision. So, so this is what we try to monitor. That requires some input from you. What doesn't require input from you is this kind of new crazy technology we have called uh, optical coherence tomography that can take like an ultrasound of the eye, both uh, this person has macular degeneration, actually. You can see the kind of spottiness in the center of the eye. But this can, it takes a picture of the layers of the retina, and it can do it with the optic nerve, too. And you can see it over time if it's changing, and it shouldn't be. It's called an OCT for short, Optical Coherence Tomographer. So, and this is, uh, we, have, we have them at our clinics, um, but, you know, they're $60,000 machines, give or take 40 uh, depending on which brand you get. And uh, so we have other eye doctors that are smaller and, and don't have them who refer patients just to have this done, and then the patient goes back to their home base. Okay. So I was kind of, uh, for, for the record, I was kind of mixing topics there. It, you do an OCT for glaucoma, but this is a picture of macular degeneration. Um, I guess I'm just realizing that at the moment. Um, there are eye drops. is typically the first line of defense in the U.S. for this. In Europe, it'd be laser, and I'll show you that. But um, one of the most popular ones, because you only have to use it before bed each day, although you do have to use it usually indefinitely is the problem, uh, is a prostaglandin analog, it's called. Um, and they are famous for, you might know it from the drug that makes your eyelashes grow, Latisse. Same stuff. <laughs> so, so it has the happy effect for many patients of giving them more eyelashes. I, I don't know if my male patients like that quite as much as my female patients as a rule. But uh, <laughs> it has a potentially the unhappy effect of changing a medium-colored eye like mine into a darker eye. My own grandma had this happen. Uh, you know, I was used to her, my green-eyed grandma, and then she became my brown-eyed grandma as she got older. And that's, that's an irreversible thing we can't always predict what will happen with. It doesn't seem to affect blue eyes as much. But if you're in that medium kind of range, uh, it will generally darken the eye. It's a very convenient drop to use if you're going to use drops, though. It's only once a day. Um, 
Some other ones that we use commonly, the beta blocker type of drops, the yellow cap or the alpha adrenergic agonist, which puts you to sleep if you use them midday, but they, uh, that can be fun before bed instead. So there, there are some drops for this. Um, again, that's a standard in the U.S. Overseas, they're more likely to do the selective laser trabeculoplasty, it's called, and they, this is done at outpatient in your street clothes. You go into a microscope, it's bright. They might give you some numbing drops just to make it a little less bright. They might put Velcro strap on your head just to keep you from jumping. But uh, it, it doesn't hurt exactly. There's a, a, a sort of a contact lens with a mirror in it put on the eye, and then this is used to uh, open up the drain in the eye so the pressure goes down to allow better blood flow to the optic nerve. And, uh, you know, frankly, uh, there are other pr procedures, too. This one is a trabeculectomy on the right that's, that's typically done during cataract surgery. It's about a 45-minute procedure under general. So that's, that's for severe glaucoma that's not responding. Um, and uh, my grandma had that one, too. But the, uh, the, uh, generally, I, I would say the average person, you know, this is the one where you don't have to take drops at night, the SLT on the left, and it's a one-time procedure covered by major medical if you're lucky enough to have that. I don't know if it's covered by the Affordable Care Act, but I assume it is. It's a standard of care procedure, um, and it's cheaper than drops in the long run. I did want to share with you, um, redacting the name but otherwise with permission, a, a case of a kid I saw with a couple of my interns. Uh, this kid, really bright kid, had been di lucky to be diagnosed, I guess, at a young age with EDS, if, if that is a good way to say that. If you're going to be diagnosed, you might as well be diagnosed when you're young. His brother had it too, uh, and um, I assume... Uh, one of the parents, but uh, he actually came in to see me for the vision therapy because he was having trouble getting his eyes to stay single for reading in school. And he came in one day for his vision therapy and said, you know, I'm having trouble seeing up high on uh, this left eye of mine. <laughs> and I said, oh, that's very descriptive of you. <laughs> I think I know what that is. So we ran a quick screening visual field on him, and we found he was, sure enough, on his left eye, uh, I'm sorry, his right eye, uh, it's on the left because this is him looking out at the world, he, was, he was, actually was missing some of his visual field. We talked to his pediatrician, and he had a pediatric cardiologist because he has EDS, and they determined his blood volume was pr probably low. So they put him on electrolytes. I think it was Pedialyte, not exactly Gatorade, but, you know, similar thing. And he came back for therapy every week, and then uh, we tested him a month or so later, and his visual field came back, which doesn't happen usually. <laughs> Glaucoma and things, you're just trying to stop it from getting worse. Uh, in his case, it actually came back. So... Uh, I, I, I uh, have now shared this with doctors at a national meeting, although the first time I gave it this title and they rejected me right away without, I think, reading it. <laughs> so uh, it just goes to show that blood volume issues, if you have a, I think he had a leaky mitral valve, a mitral valve pro prolapse, and it helped, it wasn't getting quite enough blood volume to the head until he took electrolytes, and that was decreasing blood flow to the optic nerve, which in turn caused him a little bit of tunnel vision. So, so sometimes it's a very easy fix. I don't know the Gatorade type of things are the best thing for your teeth, but, you know, there are sometimes uh, easy solutions to this. The final thing I'll end with is, is the connective tissue in the back of the eye. When the sclera is weak and the eye's grown really long, you have a lot of nearsightedness, uh, you are at risk for having a thin retina, and thin retinas can tear or detach. And, that's, um, and sometimes they happen spontaneously. Um, some have felt this is the weak point in the eye. I think even we could get into a long discussion about intelligent design versus, versus evolution on this because it... it, it to some, it's a flaw, uh, you know, and, and uh, here you, you, what you can see is a schematic picture of when there's a, what we call a horseshoe tear in the retina and fluid leaks around behind it, then it'll pull more retina off. And retina is, of course, the paper-thin layer that you use to see. And so it's, um, that's a real problem, and it does happen more likely when you have high nearsightedness, as often with EDS. So the, the early signs of this are these angioid streaks um, that uh, are mentioned in Dr. Driscoll's book and others. And I don't think, you know, you haven't seen too many retinas before today, I imagine. But uh, here we have one where we have optic nerve on the left and macula is the dark spot in the center. And there, what's this weird honeycomb that's the white lines all over this? That's some sclera showing through. And so there are some cracks forming in what we, we call Brooks membrane, but there are cracks in, through the retina that has to do with, you know, it's a bad stretch mark now because now those are weak spots potentially. Um, the thing is you, you, you can do something about those, um, and we have now injections and, and some lasers to, to strengthen them if that's a problem, both of which are done by ophthalmology. So um, patients sometimes will get a symptom when they're getting these kind of bad stretching in the retina and the poor blood flow on top of it, the, the POTS thing, which I think you're more familiar with than I am, right? Um, let's see, the GIF file is hard to see here. It's on my screen. It animates. But uh, has anyone ever seen kind of staticky vision? 
some of us get this when we get out of the, the hot tub or stand up too quickly. Yeah, that's usually a sign of, uh, if you're getting kind of visual snow, we call it, in your vision everywhere, uh, it's a sign that you have low blood flow to the head. And sometimes it happens just because you've been lying down a long time watching TV or something, uh, got up too fast. But other times it's low blood volume or it's, you know, it's, again, because the, maybe the heart valve is a little leaky and other things, it's not quite getting a full, full pumping pressure up against gravity. So, so that can happen uh, for sure. And if you have that going on, um, you might have some of these android streaks as well, which, which have more to do with the structure of the retina than the blood flow, but they, they kind of go together. They might want to do a fluorescein injection. It's a yellow dye injection. Instead of putting it in the front of the eye, they'll put it in the back of the hand. I've done these about 30 seconds later. It'll be in the eye. You won't know, but, uh, but you can take pictures, and it'll show if there are any leakages. And leakages can be fixed with a laser by an ophthalmologist. So that's, when I did these, I, I had an ophthalmologist from Will's Eye Hospital in Philadelphia who was across the hall from me, come up every other Saturday, chauffeur-driven car so he didn't mess up his hands. <laughs> you know, and, and he, would, he would laser these little spots to keep them from, from leaking more, and that can help fix your vision, save your vision from getting a detachment. Um, I'll figure out how to use this sooner or later. There's also injection you can get, and, and you know most people sticking a needle in their eye is probably their biggest fear <laughs> among us, uh, very few others. And, uh, but this is actually these anti-vascular endothelial growth factor drugs, or VEGF we call them, drugs, um, one of which is much more expensive than the other. Uh, they actually have been shown, if you get them on a monthly basis, particularly when you're in crisis, they've been shown to, um, to save vision. So if you're, this is usually folks that have diabetes get these. Um, so if you're in a bad way and you're getting problems with leaky fluids in the eye that might detach your retina, this is a good way to, to save your sight without having to laser it a lot. Um, and again, it may require good insurance. These two drugs, by the way, made by the same company. And look at the difference in price. Yeah, yeah, it just smells bad, doesn't it? <laughs> so, uh, what you don't want is the curtain over your vision effect and the, the, the lightning flashes and the so many floaters in my eyes, it looks like a swarm of gnats that weren't there yesterday. That's a sign there's been a retinal tear detachment. And so here is a picture of one. Uh, the detachment is up top, and you can see it's all out of focus because you can't focus light looking in any more than the patient can see looking out. And there's no vision while the detachment's going on, but the, the retina does live for a while, particularly the peripheral retina can live for months. You know, little tears and things, and it can be reattached, and it will, um, it's kind of like the root of the dandelion stayed still in the soil behind it, and it's just the top of the dandelion got pulled off. The rest of it's still alive. You can get it reattached. You don't want it to come off the center of your vision, and this eye, it's hard to tell. I think it's a right eye. The macula should be darkly pigmented, but we might be off to the side a bit. In any case, when the center of your vision comes off, that's a same-day kind of thing. Then you want to, no matter hour of the day or night or the weekend holiday, you want to get that reattached within 24 hours. And you probably want to lie on your back as much as you can until you do and have gravity hold it in place. So, um, again, higher risk for pe people that are higher, more highly nearsighted and that have connective tissue disorder. Um, and it can be, they can do surgeries for this these days, which is the good news. Here's a patient who's had a retina reattached. And other than where that white line is, which is what we call a scleral buckle, they can see. They've got a little blind line there, but that's it. And so, and often what they'll do is check the other eye too, and if they'll find weak spots, and they often do, they'll shore those up ahead of time prophylactically. So, so yeah, so there's some good news here. Uh, you know, when the surgeons get done with you, they, they horse the eye around a little. You might need my prism afterwards because you might be seeing double, but you can see, you know, and, that's, and that, all the rest can be fixed with glasses. And so, so um, you know, that, that's good news. And, and it doesn't hurt usually for this kind of stuff. I, I'm told that the what the trigeminal nerve, if the venous apply to that, is what causes the eye ache sometimes in EDS. But this retinal attachment, there are no pain receptors in the back of the eye, really. So it, it, it doesn't hurt. Um, all right. So I, I just will close with a quote from the good Dr. Driscoll, who's been uh, kind enough to educate me and many of you, uh, is that just because you have EDS and we can't get rid of that doesn't mean that we can't get rid of some of the eye things that go with it, so, or at least manage them. You know? and, and, and so keep that in mind. And she also points out, and this surprised me, that she says the, uh, if your vision is fluctuating, it may, don't just blame your, your syndrome. It may be something like diabetes so that can be treated other ways you know, and that we have a better handle on maybe in, in many ways. So, so that's, that's what you have a picture of here is the bleeding in the back of the eye. It can sometimes lead to glaucoma and everything else, but it's diabetes. It's not EDS. All right, now I will entertain your questions if I haven't worn you out with all my talking. And I, I see one from uh, the, the good doctor who's running the clinic. Yes. <laughs> so. um, I have a question about dry eyes. And is there any danger in allowing the eyes to remain dry um, and sort of, you know, separate the eyes from the retina so that it really shouldn't be treated? 
Okay, so the question is on a chronic dry eye, is there danger, can there be harm from not treating it over time? And there is a little. I, I would say that the common mild to moderate dry eye person probably is not causing any permanent harm. They might be losing some corneal sensitivity, which can snowball sometimes when the eyes get drier. But the main trouble we, we see in parts of the world where they're vitamin A deficient, uh, for example, that can lead to scarring of the cornea, which is only removable superficially by laser and then with a transplant if it gets too deep. And that, it can be a blinding condition if it's combined with something like a vitamin A deficiency. Um, that's what we call keratomalacia. But, uh, yeah, dry eye, regular dry eye, um, not a huge danger there. It would probably become very painful and, and start to be noticeable before you, know, you get the kind of the coral – dry coral appearance of the white of the eye on the conjunctiva and things before it gets to that point. So there are many signs that that's, um, that's coming, I think, and most of them patients don't like the feel of. So that makes sense? So it's not, a, it's not a silent blinding condition. Other questions? Did I see one in the back and then Jan, or Jan first? I don't know. It's, okay, we'll go to her. I guess you guys are being so polite to each other. <laughs> no, I didn't, and I probably should. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the question is, I didn't mention astigmatism, uh, and uh, and at least one in the room has has it, and and has pointy eyes in addition. And I wonder why my computer finally went to sleep after all this time. Oh, I'm not changing slides. Uh, yeah, the uh, it, how is astigmatism related to Ehlers-Danlos, I guess, is, is part of the question. It is. Well, in keratoconus and other conditions of irregular corneas, we call that irregular astigmatism. But, but maybe people are wondering what astigmatism is. We've all heard the term. and it's, <laughs> It does come from an, an eyeball, and particularly a cornea, that is rather less round and more egg-shaped. A better way to describe it might be what it does to your vision. And what I tell a lot of my patients is if you look at your reflection in a shiny spoon, you know how, depending on how you're holding the spoon handle, how it would stretch out your face. <laughs> and that's what astigmatism does to your vision. It makes things a little misshapen near and far. And it's because of an oval shape to some structure in the eye, often the front of the eye. Irregular astigmatism is when uh, that spoon has been mangled by the garbage disposal, so to speak, <laughs> and now it's, it's distorted in addition, so a regular spectacle lens might not be able to fully correct it. Contact lenses have come a long way. I don't know when you last tried, but um, definitely if, if we have a astigmatism that doesn't respond to a regular contact lens, we call them toric for, uh, for astigmatism, then we, we would do one of those specialty ones, particularly the, the harder, like the scleral lens, and then your tears would fill in any irregularities and, and it would fix the astigmatism up to a certain point. Um, and keratoconus, they often have five, ten diopters of astigmatism, sometimes more. It's crazy amounts that go beyond what our machines can measure unless you have one of those topographers. Yeah, would I recommend a contact lens or especially contact lens? for If you have high astigmatism and you're not seeing well with your glasses, then that probably would be my next recommendation. If not, you know, if you have keratoconus, then you, you might look into that corneal collagen cross-linking we talked about. So, okay, we had another question in the back. Let me get the back row and then the second to back row. Yes, yeah. It is very hard for an eye doctor, and it frustrates my students all the time, but I think even seasoned eye doctors, particularly the ones that, you know, they're prescribing glasses all day at Kaiser or at the, at the mall and are good at that, but when you have an irregular type of astigmatism that might be a keratoconus is the question, and, you know, you said you, you were diagnosed um, with some astigmatism, they haven't done anything about it, but it's disturbing your vision. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I, I think it is possible that you have one of those irregular astigmatisms, due to an irregular cornea, and uh, yeah, that might be worth again, getting the corneal map done and seeing if, uh, uh, you know, if that's a fixable with a contact lens, maybe a specialty one, or, or, or someone who's really uh, careful with glasses, maybe you're still at the point where you could see better than you are, you know, <laughs> with, with a regular pair of glasses. Yeah. Okay, so the question is, is astigmatism and glaucoma in the family related? You have a family history in their 30s. Yeah, there, there are some folks that, that don't have just the, uh, 
what we call the primary open angle glaucoma, but have a secondary glaucoma that runs in families. Often those are when the, the, the drain in the eye that's all in a circle around the iris is anatomically narrow, or maybe the iris pigment is being shed and clogging the drain, you know, those kind of things. And yeah, and I don't think there's a relationship between astigmatism and um, most glaucomas, but y your family might have a, a special secondary glaucoma that I don't see a lot of, and, and it's possible, but I don't think it's a high correlation. Yeah. Good question. I hope I'm right on that. <laughs> question up here. Okay, so you're getting what I would describe as maybe 30 minute after images. Yeah. Is that right? When you look at a strong light or, or at the sun, and but your after images aren't lasting like a, a typical camera flash would go away in a few seconds, but yours is lasting for for a half an hour. Yeah. And and is that related? That that's a really good question. So let me tell you. Let me kind of think out loud about this because I haven't thought of this before. Um, light adaptation usually takes about six minutes to go from fully dark like you're in a dark movie theater matinee and you go outside to a sunny day, it takes about six minutes on average. And most of us recover from bright lights, like when bright headlights pass us on the road, in less time than that. Um, so if you're getting half an hour um, recovery times, my best guess is that it's, it, it's the, the two types of sensors on the retina are the rods and the cones you might have heard of, rods see at night, cones see during the day. Your cones are giving you a slow recovery time. Um, that could indicate you have some of the uh, the angioid streaks on the retina that we were that I showed here. I, I, not a detachment now, but some of this kind of stuff may be going on. You see how some of these streaks go through the dark center of the eye. Uh, if that's happening, your cones might be impaired. There are a couple ways to test that. There's glare testing where you can test glare recovery time, and there are norms for different ages of of life. The best way though is to get an electro retinogram. We have this at our Hillsborough Clinic, but that would be where you look at a checkerboard or a honeycomb kind of pattern. They have a contact lens on the eye with a wire that it doesn't hurt, but it measures the um, conduction from cornea to retina, and it will measure if the cones are working like they should be. And so that, that might be the way to find out if you – and now, can you treat it? If you have that, it depends. If you have a, a relate, you know, EDS, I, I guess – I haven't heard this being common with that, but there are some conditions that are vitamin deficiencies, basically. They might be genetic, but you need more vitamin A, which helps us to see at night or that kind of thing. That... Right, and there's night blindness with that. Okay, so you have some night blindness, too. Yeah, vitamin A is often related to that, and there are some conditions like retinitis pigmentosa comes to mind that, uh, that if you have night blindness and poor glare recovery, we would call it, uh, you might get that checked out to see if there's a treatment to at least arrest it where it is, if not recover yeah, and you can get a blood test for vitamin A too. And happy to talk with you more about sure, that if you yeah. have you. Oh, good. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know about the count being different, but now with the optical coherence tomography, we can um, maybe get a better sense of that if we start to uh, to run these OCT type of scans, which are painless and non-invasive, and uh, once you have the machine, cheap to do. Uh, yeah, that'd be worth doing. Maybe there will be a comment section on the, the web version of this, but can I just ask anyone else in the room experiencing similar things of, of glare recovery time? And I see at least a couple hands, yeah. Night blindness kind of issues beyond what your peers are experiencing. Yeah, okay, well, you've taught me something today. I'd like, I'd like to see the cause of it. It's, uh, yeah, because then maybe we can come up with a treatment if we, uh, even if we can't get rid of the EDS, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, so central retinal detachment, anytime you have a retinal detachment that's more than a little tear, you will get um, flashes and floaters. Now, we all get some sparkles in our vision, right? Uh, but, the, yeah, a few floaters, right? That's, that's remnants of things we had before we were born that dissolved and stayed inside the vitreous of the eye. But if you're getting that, that you know, we call it a tobacco dusting of floaters or a, a, the, the pepper shaker was sh in your eye. Somebody shook a pepper shaker. So more floaters than you ever saw in your life, and they're suddenly there one morning. You know, combined with lightning flashes when you're sitting still and not moving your eyes or head, you know, um, combined with a curtain, especially a black curtain going over part of your vision, not like tunnel vision thing, but like there's one eye I can't see on the on the side or something, that would be an indication. And if it went over the center of your vision, Lord forbid, it would be uh, the center of the eye couldn't see. You just see out of the corner somewhere. So uh, your eye would look normal in the mirror and everything, but yeah, good question. 
Okay, we have another one in the middle. <laughs> well, what what, he, what the doctor's saying there is that compared to every other patient I've seen this week, year, month, you know, uh, your your number is is top in the charts. And and okay, so so now the question is is it secondary to the Ehlers Danlos syndrome if you have more floaters than everyone else that the your eye doctor is reporting to you? Um, as far as treatment goes, um, I, I would think maybe one it is related to EDS because we, you know if the vitreous cavity in the eye is more like a big blob of clear jello that doesn't circulate throughout life. It becomes more liquid over time, much like leaving a bowl of jello out on a warm day, but it, it doesn't circulate. So any, any debris that gets in there, little red blood cells, pieces of blood vessel, what have you, if they don't settle to the bottom, you'll see them just like uh, the shadows in a snow globe. You know, it's, that's, that's where they'll be. So that's where it probably came from. As far as treatment, I know a few ophthalmologists that are using laser to make big floaters into little floaters um, and hoping they will settle. But the only way to really remove them is to do a vitrectomy which is where they remove all that fluid from the eye and replace it with saline. And they pretty much, because when they do that, they put a nitrogen bubble in, but they have to try You're at risk of retinal detachment when they do that. So they have to be pretty darn bothersome, like I, I can't drive anymore, kind of bothersome, for you to want to do a vitrectomy. Pretty much we do vitrectomies only in bad eye injury, um, retinal detachment and scleral buckle, and maybe blood in the eye where you can't see out, we can't see in. So... Okay, yeah, yeah. So, so you, you have one eye with real high astigmatism and also a retina detachment but not tear is what you've, yeah. So, it, yeah, so, it, it, uh, you know, it's the astigmatism is mostly on the front of the eye, but the stretching of the eye probably caused the detachment. They're probably not completely unrelated for sure. Um, and I'm glad if, if blood pressure medication is, kept that under control, That's you know, that would be similar to the acetazolamide, which is a diuretic and, and used for, for eye pressure and other things. All the things, yeah. yeah. And I imagine very many uh, in the room and listening to me elsewhere are probably on similar medications for heart repair and, and that sort of thing. All right, so question in the front. Daily fluctuations in vision. Okay. All right. So let, let me see. If, let, let me repeat the question. Let me see if I can do a little bit of troubleshooting again, uh, knowing that that we have a the barest of doctor-patient relationships. But <laughs> I'll do what I can. Uh, the question was: I have daily fluctuation of vision, is what you're saying, and you you're wearing uh, you have several pairs of glasses that have been tested and told that they are correct. Uh, you, today you're wearing a pair that's that's uh, from the 70s, I think you said, and and other days. The, Today, this is clear, but other days you may have to choose a different pair in order to get that to work, and why is that going on? All right, so, so Dr. Driscoll, who I put up on the screen finally, is, uh, you know, would say, of course, it could be fluctuating blood sugar, and in your case it might not be, but you know, for other folks, that's probably the number one cause of fluctuations in vision is when blood sugar is not well controlled. Uh, high, high blood sugar changes pressure in the eye and everything else, and swelling of the lens and the other ocular tissues. Um, but assuming it's not that, what, well, yeah, and I believe you, um, so uh, what I see a lot of is people that have a binocular vision problem where it's an eye alignment issue. They're not quite getting double vision. But, but one thing that um, a lot of people don't know, including <laughs> too many of my students, is that between clear single vision and double vision is blurry vision. If the eyes are, are wandering a bit and either up, down, or left, right, then yeah, yeah, you seem to be aware of maybe that's the case with you, left, right, then you'll be at the edge of double vision, and the edge of double vision is blurry. And so that would be consistent with your symptoms. Um, it also, most eye doctors, ophthalmology and optometry, are checking the nearsighted, farsighted power. They're checking the astigmatism. They might be checking the bifocal power for sure uh, for people like you and me. But the, uh, they aren't going past to look for prism. 
And so you might need a prism test to see if, if, if it was up and down, side by side, double, and then how much. Okay, so we have an outward wandering eye, and it's, it goes so far out that it's, it's buried out in the side near your ear. There is a, um, what do they say, prisms are kind of like the, uh, the white composite fillings in your teeth. They are technique sensitive, I think is the term doctors use, and that's a term for saying that um, unlike the rest of the eyeglasses, they are, uh, not all doctors get the same number, and having the wrong amount of prism can be as bad as having no prism. Uh, it'll often take a double vision that you, or near double vision that you're used to and put it somewhere else where it's still not quite single. So I, I would still probably go down that road. I have seen patients who, uh, who have prism has been attempted, maybe from ophthalmology. And uh, while some, like the pediatric ophthalmologists that operate on muscles, are, are the only ones I know that know what to do with prism, they, um, they sometimes still, the, the first amount isn't, isn't the right amount. And so I'm, I might get that checked again, because if you're, if you're aware you have a wandering eye and you have fluctuating vision, uh, you know, and prism was tried once but not successfully, um, it might be worth trying again. Another th test you could do at home, though, to, to ensure this is when your vision fluctuates, if you're able to cover or close one eye or the other, and it's clear either eye alone, it's just the two eyes together that are blurry, then that's not keratoconus or anything else. That's, that's eye misalignment. So, yeah, yeah. So, so then it's just a matter of finding the right amount of prism. I'm not, it's possible that you would need still two pairs of glasses, one with a lot and one with a little bit, but, you know, for different days. But, but uh, that, that would be my guess is that you – Yeah, yeah, so getting someone for the old hardcore Well, they they they've come back. Uh the question is with 30 years of hard contact lens where uh all through your youth and 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 we were told by a KCI doctor that it was uh it was a good thing. You know, it, it, it's been a it's, you know, and it's, I know what they're talking about. It's definitely the, the old, the original hard lenses before the gas permeable ones that are semi-hard. You know, they, they, um, they lasted forever. If you didn't lose a break them, they gave very clear vision. The trouble we had with them is they didn't breathe well. And as a result, the, the back layer of the cornea often, instead of looking like a honeycomb, became all funny shaped. And that's the pump that keeps the cornea clear. And so the concern was if the endothelium of the cornea broke down from these lenses, would you get a white cornea and then need that terrible transplant that none of us want? So, um, so that's why we pulled patients out of them. And it often took years to even get a good glasses prescription again because it, it, they used to say it took a month for every year you're wearing the hard lenses for your eyes to return to the normal shape. So if you're wearing them 30 years, it might take 30 months to get a good glasses prescription. And yeah, yeah. And, and so I do understand. But, but you might consider if you were successful and, and want them again is going to the new scleral lenses. They're made of new material that breathes, and they're going to be a little larger. But they could, again, they could vault over any irregularities in your cornea without messing up the back part of the cornea that needs to, to do the pumping. You're welcome. And I don't even fit those because uh, that's our contact lens people. But <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, I think that probably is a, a good option for a lot of EDS patients. It might not help with the dark adaptation, light adaptation issue, but uh, that's probably a little more in my department. But. Well, I, I hope, but you tell me in a year. <laughs> you know, that's, uh, when, when, proof, proof is in the pudding, right, exactly. Further question from... Dr. Goodell. Okay, so so floaters that come and go, they get worse with dehydration and migraine onset. All right, so the, it is definitely true that a lot of people that get the uh, the true unilateral headache migraine get a migraine aura. Um, some lucky few just get the aura and no headache, and others just get the headache and no aura. But, but uh, I'm not one of those, those folks, but I'm, I'm told by all that get them, including some family, that, um, yeah, that, that, that's sort of the, what I call it, the scintillating scotoma, which is the blind spot that's created by probably blood flow issues. They think what migraines are what triggered by toxins now, 
but there is there is probably still a constriction and a dilation of the ophthalmic artery that creates the, the visual aura effects that people are getting. So it, it's probably that. Uh, I do know that from my nutrition studies, and I take this from the Linus Pauling Institute at Oregon State, which uh, has a wonderful micronutrient information center online, and you can look up things like migraines, but they, they've shown a couple things if you're looking for sort of treatment. One is magnesium. It's easy to remember because magnesium is for migraines, and I've, I've helped some of our students to avoid their migraines by taking daily magnesium. The only side effect seems to, besides in your pocketbook, seems to be, uh, uh, you know, there's a laxative effect if you take too much. Um, the other one is, is that the riboflavin, again, the uh, vitamin B2, um, is needed by migraineurs in higher amounts and may help to decrease the aura effects that you're getting. Now, I have heard, while we're speaking on this topic, I have for people that are on high vitamin C, as Linus Pauling himself was, uh, that that may increase the perception, at least, of floaters. And I think it does that. I think you're seeing more red blood cells in the, in the um, retinal vasculature when that happens. So, um, so people that are getting a lot of floaters and are on high doses of vitamin C, that may be less of a concern. If they really bother you, you might trim the vitamin C back a little. Well, I, I do think it's a good idea to take it. But um, does that fully answer, or is, it, you know, is, there, is there another one? Floaters that come and go, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, the dehydration effects are interesting. Uh, it shouldn't affect the vitreous directly, but I do know if you do have that snow globe effect where the floaters have settled to the bottom of the eye, and if you then do aerobic exercise, and a, a lot of the PTs I know are, are big on this. I live next door to one. <laughs> you know, it's all about treadmills. <laughs> and, uh, the, the kind of jarring aerobic exercise will stir up your floaters. It won't create new ones unless you have, again, fragile vessels or something, some leakage back there. But it will cause the snow globe to stir up, and you will, should see them more under those situations. You're probably getting dehydrated from the exercise as well. So it may be more the aerobic effect of the bouncing than of – so a stationary bike wouldn't do it, you know. Uh, that kind of thing. Spin class would be less likely to cause it. So, yeah, the people always, uh, the question is on the ski lift. Yeah, the floaters are always more noticeable against a bright background. So when we do get the blue sky in Oregon, when we do get the rare snow or you go up to Mount Hood, or, uh, or when uh, you're looking at a plain white wall that's well lit, uh, your, your normal, if, you, if you have floaters that are friends, you should make friends with your normal floaters because I've named one of mine. It lives, lives on the bottom of my eye. I call it the catfish because it comes out when I lean back. But, uh, so, but yeah, I mean, it's, you, you should make friends because you have them for life. Short of the vitrectomy, you have them for life, so you might as well get on friendly terms. There is a new kind of floater that we do get with age, and you get it faster if you're nearsighted, and that's the posterior vitreous detachment. Sounds like retinal detachment, but it isn't. It, it will sometimes cause the lightning kind of flashes of light, but it's, it's more of that liquefaction of the vitreous cavity that, that creates a shadow if it's close to the retina. If you're lucky, you get one out in the side. If you're not lucky, you get it in the center. It takes months for it to seem to go away. Um, but, but that's something that we all get if we're lucky to live long enough. And, um, you know, I guess we should count our blessings there. Okay, are they moving in a pattern? So we have small floaters are moving in a pattern. Are they moving in a pattern that might be similar to the blood vessel pattern on the retina? Okay, there is something called the Shearer phenomenon. It's, I think, spelled S C H E E R E R. Um, Shearer phenomenon, which is, is seeing your white blood cells going through the retinal vasculature. So it's not actually a floater, but those, those arteries and veins, particularly the capillaries, are on top of the retina. They're going in front of the rods and the cones. And the cones are very sensitive to small things. And it, on the, in the right lighting, and if you have good blood circulation, you're a healthy PT, <laughs> you might be seeing your white blood cells go by. And that's, yeah, they, you might look up the Shearer phenomenon. And, uh, yeah, that's, I teach visual perception, too. So I, I, I try to be, like I said, a mile wide and a mile deep <laughs> as best I can. Okay, I see a hand in the back and then in the second to back row next. But uh, you first? Okay, in the red. <laughs> Yes. Okay, so the question is about loose eyelids. Continue. With that, um, I don't feel like because I'm not being close to the eyeball, it's not Okay, so so again, you're, you're not sure you're a zebra, but the uh, <laughs> am I using that term too much? I don't know. <laughs> but uh, the uh, uh, you know I see stripes in the back, and it keeps reminding me. <laughs> Isn't it even on the cover of Dr. Driscoll's book? <laughs> yeah, I think so. 
kind of green and blue zebra. So the, the, the thing is you're feeling like a foreign body sensation we described as stuff in your eye all the time. You cannot find it to save your life looking in the eye, a makeup mirror or whatever you might use. And so is it possible that it's not the eyes aren't fully shutting, but they're just they're not in close proximity to the globe of the eye? And, yeah, I suppose that is possible for sure. There are probably ways to test that theory, like if we put some dye in your eye and had you blink, just regular, not a hard blink, and, and see if the dye moves, you know, if the tear film remains untouched and is drying up. We, we, we look sometimes when we put the fluorescein dye in the eye to see, we tell you not to blink for as many seconds as you can, and it's supposed to be 10, 15 seconds or more until we start to see dry spots. And in some folks, it happens much more quickly. And so if you're getting, if your tear duct is wide open, you're getting quick, rapid drainage, and the squeegee effect is not fully uh, working, then that, that could be the case. Um, you know, you could do the tear replacement with an artificial tear would be one way. Maybe you're doing that already to try to flush. That would be the first thing. You know, for 9 or $10, you can get an artificial tear. By the way, uh, just so you know, most of us are familiar with the generic over-the-counter eyedrop being a Visine. And I'm not against Visine, but there are different kinds of Visine. <laughs> there's the Get the Red Out Visine, which is probably not what you want to use as a tear, right? And then there's Visine for contact lenses, and there's Visine tears. And so it would be a, a tear of, without the medication in it. Um, and... Preservative-free is sometimes what people need who have to use a lot of them in order not to get a preservative buildup effect, you know, that bothers the eyes. So, hope that helps some. And now, oh yeah, there's the zebra scarf in the back. <laughs> so. Yeah. So, questions about sleeping with the eyes half or part way open. We have a name for that. Did you know? We we actually call that uh, lag up thalmos. <laughs> the eyes are la the eyelids are lagging behind, uh, you know. And we could even we could even give it an adjective. We could call it nocturnal lag up thalmos, and then we could chart it and bill bill you for it. But <laughs> so, but I won't bill you today. So okay, so so you yeah you have a witness that that looks at you while you're asleep, and the, they say, hey, I can see. Uh, do they, are they seeing white of the eye? Or are they seeing the colored part underneath the cornea, kind of iris? You know. Okay, so if you can see, then your cornea is is the visible part, and that's. You know, ideally when we sleep, we have what's called the Bell's reflex, and that, that is the eyes, like when something comes at you, the eyes roll up and to protect the cornea and keep it moist. So even if the eyes are open, it's just the white of the eye that gets a little bit dry. But if you can see while you're sleeping, <laughs> that's kind of spooky. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, um, probably do you have to wear a mask to sleep or anything, or is it just really dark? To hold the eyelid shut, yeah. Okay, so other than using the down pillow, is there a surgical or other solution for lag up thalamus when the eyes aren't shutting at night? There are a couple solutions, and let me just kind of list them off. Traditionally, uh, the cheapest one uh, you may already be using is the, the artificial tear ointment that you put in at night, non-medicated ointment, uh, Refresh PM is one brand. Uh, and you let it, it makes your vision blurry. It's like a Vaseline for the eye, but um, it keeps it moist. They use the same thing in surgeries to keep the eye moist when you, you aren't awake to blink. Um, the, uh, the next treatment is, well, there's something called lid tape. It's like a surgical tape made for you. <laughs> you can actually tape your eyelids shut at night, and uh, you've got to buy a roll every month or something. And if you get up to use the bathroom or something, you have to remember your eyes are taped shut. <laughs> but... Uh, but I have patients who do it, and they do it chronically, or they do it in the in the uh, summer months when it's dry around here, or when they have air conditioning on. Um, you don't want to probably use a ceiling fan, at least not pointed down at the bed. You know, some people have pointed up at the ceiling so it pulls air up, but not points it towards them. I often recommend a tabletop humidifier for on the nightstand. So, uh, and I, I really like the ones that are shaped like an elephant or a dragon, but uh, that could be because I have a three-year-old. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but, okay, so th there are also, there are lid weights for people who don't get a full blank. They can actually sew a gold weight in the eye. This is getting to the surgical things. Gold, for, for whatever reason, like in your mouth, doesn't seem to interfere with biological processes, may even help with arthritis. And so uh, that can help. Uh, it's just enough weight to help your muscle to fully close the lid, both when you blink during the day and at night. They, yeah, they tuck it up kind of in the ridge, uh, up, you know, at the top of the eyelid. It's done by an oculoplastic surgeon so that you don't want just any, even just any ophthalmologist to do it. You want someone who does – their ophthalmologist just do eyelids, and that's who you want to do this kind of thing. And the final thing is uh, they do this mostly for droopy lids, but there's a – called a blepharoplasty where they would remove excess skin usually from an eyelid in order to tighten it up. And so that, that's an option as well. Um, and there are some other techniques. that there, Those are mostly – 
the last two are from ophthalmology, there's some cauterization techniques that optometrists will sometimes do that have been doing it for a long time that, that can tighten eyelids without other surgery, without removing tissue. Uh, they numb you up with an injection, and then they, they um, by basically using a, a hot, very small little iron thing, they can tighten things up. They can turn eyelids that are turned inward, and the eyelashes are scratching, they turn them out. And, I, yeah, it's a crazy thing. I don't do that, but I, I know good doctors that do that. So. <laughs> Well, yeah, that one would be one for uh, usually done for inward turned lids. The, the ones with extra tissue, they might remove. In your case, it's the, the lid tape or the weight might be the better consideration uh, overall, as crazy as those things sound. Uh, you could, of course, always nice to try the uh, the temporary version to make sure it's going to solve your problem. So, you know, the tape could be tried for a week or more and, you know, make sure it makes you happy. It, it, they do have those nice masks with the, the frozen gel and stuff. Yeah, so I've always wanted to try those, but I never do. Wow. So. Yeah, you said it was a family trait to use the down pillow. <laughs> yeah. Does he have the dragon humidifier? <laughs> Oh, the frog. Okay, well, I can live with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's the, yeah. These are these are real issues. Um, I mean, and I think forced air gas heat in the winter is pretty dry for a lot of us too. You know, it's I don't know how many heats are moist heats. I guess we used to back east. We used to have oil heat, and we'd have radiators, and we'd put you know a pot of water on the radiator to keep it moist uh, as well. Jan has a question over here, and then. Oh, it's it's true. Yeah, so you're talking about eye crunchiness caused by allergies. Yeah, and there there are many pretty uh, low side effect mast cell stabilizers and antihistamine combinations. I mean, the the, the branded ones that you get by prescription that are expensive, are like the patinol type of things. Uh, over the counter now, you can get Zatator. We do a lot of Alloway, uh, same active ingredient as in Zatator. You get a 10 milliliter bottle for under fifteen dollars. It's a combination mast cell stabilizer for the long term effect and an antihistamine for the short term itch relief. Uh, and and you, if you're getting symptoms, and sometimes allergic symptoms are similar to dry eyes. Certainly, the more allergens deposit on the eyes when they're drier, uh, and you can get these the concretions we call them with a buildup of calcium salts inside the eyelids, which then are real scratchy. So and they can be those can be removed, but you don't want to have them happen over and over. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. Keratoconus absolutely can can affect the uh, effectiveness of your blink and can lead to dry eye symptoms. Was was there another question up front? I'll come, I'll come sweeping across the room again. I promise. So. No, I understand. Yeah. It's gotten pretty. So the issues over peripheral vision cause, uh, being affected by droopy eyelids, despite having an outward turned eye that gives you good peripheral vision, now it's, is it the upper vision in particular, uh, or in the corners as well, out, out of the corners towards the ears? So, so that you might be a candidate for the 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 lid tuck, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and and of course the criteria for the lid tuck, the blepharoplasty, is to uh, is to have you do a visual field with the lids as they are, and then with them taped up where they would be if they did the lid tuck. And if there is a a, a loss of visual field under those conditions, then your major medical will usually cover for it. And usually you're required to go to a different doctor to have the visual field done who doesn't do the surgery. So often I'll see those folks for field. So there isn't. Yeah, that that's the best way to do it because it's it's kind of like you don't want to get your car inspected by the mechanic who's going to do the repairs. Yeah. <laughs> so, there yeah. Are, there are, I, I went to, and it just I walked in. It just happened to be there. But it was a uh, clinic. I just based on my scenario. Why Medicare? 
Yeah, so this was like a, 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 just a plastic surgery kind of clinic. Yeah, so generally this is something you can go to uh, an eye doctor, either a surgeon or uh, for for lids especially, or or someone who co-manages surgery like an optometrist would, uh, to to say I you know I have a problem with my my vision, my side vision because of I think my eyelids. Yeah. Yeah, no, I understand. So you'd probably be better off just going to an eye doctor that, that co-manages or manages blepharoplasty, is what it's called. But lid tuck. Um, I could pro if you actually if you call again I and I get no uh, no we're not on commission <laughs> so uh, we're on we're on salary but the uh, yeah I mean you could certainly call Pacific University and uh, they will they will route you probably not to me but to one of our uh, ocular disease clinics and say say I, I think I need a lid tuck uh, can I get an ocular disease appointment and we have a clinic in downtown Portland in the Portland Medical Center it's on 10th and Washington two blocks south of Powell's Books. Uh, and that will be the the Portland number, the three five two twenty five hundred uh, number there. Yeah, and that's all of our all of our clinics have have this. But what's great about it is, you know, you we have the latest equipment, and we, uh, you know, we're not surgeons, so we will not recommend surgery if we don't think it'll help you. But we we know good surgeons we can refer you to that you take your insurance, you know, and that's and that, that's always. We also take Medicaid and both Care Oregon and Cover Oregon. <laughs> so so that's you know, and we have sliding scale for folks that are uninsured because you know. We are we are a teaching institution. So, question in the back and then in the middle. It is. Uh, yes, yeah, we do see Kaiser patients. Some of them actually get a referral for things that Kaiser doesn't do, like the specialty contact lens. Um, but I, yeah, I have a couple of classmates that work at Kaiser, and I, I think you're right. They're very good at doing regular contacts and regular glasses. They do have ophthalmology there. But yeah, if, you, if you're having trouble finding an EDS doctor, I mean, Kaiser doctors are busy doctors, and they they take the middle of the bell curve. <laughs> you know, they see horses, not zebras, right? So yeah, so I understand how that works. But yeah, you probably would qualify for sliding scale. There's an income requirement for for, but you know, you can call up, and then we are one of the ones that offer. I think it's. Uh, you could potentially do that. I'm happy to see. I will let everyone know that I. Uh, that this is probably the reason I forgot to bring business cards. Is I'm on a research sabbatical this summer. I'm not leaving the area, but I'm seeing I'm seeing special patients, which may be all of you actually. But <laughs> so, but yes, you could see me. You can see me easier come August. But uh, you can see me. Uh, I'm still in for a couple weeks now in May until we get to graduation. But yeah, every every six or seven years they let me loose. <laughs> Yes, I do primary care and and pediatric care. Yeah, so that's right. I particularly, you know, a, a double vision is my favorite thing to treat. And so anyone having problems with needs prism, that's yeah, I'm I'm your guy. So was there a question in the pink? Uh, on the front of the eye, yeah, that was the uh, prostaglandin drops for glaucoma. So that would be the latanoprost uh, and similar drops. Let me go back to it. There it is. It, okay, if you're getting heterochromia, your eyes to change color without drops. Okay, so is it one eye or both eyes? That's interesting. Okay, well let me just I'll, I'll, I'll think out loud again. <laughs> you guys are great for making someone think on their feet. <laughs> I'm sure I will I will look back at this uh, ten years from now and wonder why I was so stupid. But uh, I'm I'm glad also that I'm not a brand new teacher because <laughs> at least I've thought of some of these things before. Um, all right, people that have one eye color change, um, it's usually a Horner syndrome, and that mo most common cause of that is migraines on one side of your head all your life. It'll cause your lid to droop a little on that side. The pupil will actually get smaller, and the eye will change color eventually from the headaches. If you get alternating sided migraines, I imagine that could cause the same thing um, to the two eyes. Okay, so Curie I am familiar with, and uh, Curie malformation uh, causes problems with cranial nerves in particular. Uh, there are cranial nerves, of course, that innervate the cornea and the iris and all that kind of thing. So I wouldn't think that would be out of the question if you're getting pinched nerves or from hydrocephalus getting some trouble with, with that. But I, I haven't run into that a whole lot. At, from either Chiari, which I've seen more of, or EDS, which I haven't seen as often, as, at least not in folks who aren't kids. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, so I, I, it's, that's a curious thing. And if there, we might want to look closely in the microscope to see is it is it a variegated color change or is it a uniform color change? Sometimes you're getting um, nodules on the iris that, from any distance, make it look like the whole iris has changed color, but actually it's a different thing. So. Um, Okay, and, and 
yeah, so it used to be up in the, in the the upper upper right of the iris picture here, and then it's become like the uh, lower right. Or yeah, yeah, that's that's quite a change without medication. I can't think of any endocrine gland or anything in the body that would produce something like this drop internally that would make that happen. Um, yeah, but it's called heterochromia when that happens. So. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you, you have a curtain on the side. Mm-hmm. And a dark a dark curtain effect with the left eye when sleeping on that side. Same picture, but it's mm-hmm. five or six shades darker. I look at it with my right eye, it's very bright. So certainly concerning, I, I think it's probably not detachment of the retina if it only lasts five minutes because those don't go away on their own. But it sounds like a dilated eye exam might be in order to find out what it is. It could be the posterior vitreous attachment. It could be a blood flow issue if it's pinching off some there. You know, but uh, it, it might be worth taking a look at just in case it's something that um, could become permanent unless you make an intervention that, that might actually be easy. So, um, yeah, yeah, w- worth checking out. And certainly concerning, but, but probably not retinal attachment, it sounds to me, so without examining you. <laughs> so, yeah. Were there other lingering questions? One more from the zebra scarf. Yeah. There is a yeah, you know the, 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 this is the mood ring effect, right? <laughs> um the, the medium colored eyes, mine are, are among them, uh can can reflect the things around them. I'm I'll be agnostic about whether they reflect mood, although that affects blood flow. So, you know, I, I, I will neither say it, it can or can't. I, I certainly would say that's not in my normal textbooks. But, but, I, but I, I would say that, um, yeah, the medium color eyes are most likely to at least look like they're changing color. I've had people swear on a stack of Bibles that I have blue eyes, and I know I don't. You know, and, and so, so, I don't know, maybe I should check my mood when that happens. <laughs> but, but uh, yeah, you, you have – now, with aging, uh, even without any syndrome, the, you know, just like when you're a baby, your eyes are often lighter. The iris actually – the color is determined not by pigment because the only pigment in it is melanin, which is brown. Uh, it's the, the how densely knit the iris is. It's, it's like a, I guess we had it there a minute ago. It's like a a basket. And if it's if it's am I, did I go the wrong direction here? Uh, if it's not densely knit, it it will appear blue because that scatters light more. It looks blue. So with when you're very small, your iris is not as dense as when you're older. Often will be the lightest of your life until you get to be uh, very elderly, and then it will tend to get lighter again. Uh, so in an elderly relative with eye changing color without Ehlers Danlos, it could be simply the aging process. With other folks. Yeah, it, it usually is something else going on. Iris is not exactly connective tissue, so I don't know. It, it, people's eyes are not getting lighter They're sometimes, right? They're getting darker, and I, it's harder to explain through connective tissue to me. Yeah, yeah. And then they go back. Yeah. Are, are we out of time? Um, also, um, Stephanie has 